as it's nowhere near as dark. How old is she? Sixty-five. Sixty-five. I mean, so, um, Steve. I mean, Steve's been about nineteen times. Yeah, he's been four times. Anyway. <laughs> and, uh, and I keep saying to him, "Where was my invite? Not one no. of the four times." Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I had a spare ticket. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, some of us work. Yeah, well, oh, yes, you worked so hard. You worked so hard. Oh, my God. You worked so hard. Hey, it's like sinister, you two. It's so, yeah, uh, yeah, what's that? It's so bitchy this morning. Yeah, I know. So well, this morning, just from it. Hey, well, listen, Julian, thank you. <laughs> David, you're coming up next in one of his 17 shows of the week. So do look forward to that. I'm back tomorrow, same time, same place. This is Talk TV. This is Talk TV. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. We're here! Good morning, everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening. I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored, in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. <laughs> ah! Me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so <laughs> rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am Sanz. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's, it's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. The one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus. Boris Johnson uh, isn't what he was. Most of them seem to have given up. Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, yes, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. He's as up. fit as a butcher's dog. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Jess. <laughs> the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. So I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, no, you're probably going to boot me off the show after this <laughs> film. <laughs> Get out! Man. Honestly, I'm not, I'm not a Swifty. Critics, I'd say me included, <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. Well, I'd rather do it on camera. No. no, 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 no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you had? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. It was a fabulous dinner <laughs> until you two uh, mooned us. <laughs> Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Uh, hello, a very good morning to you. It's just after 7 o'clock now on Saturday, October the 21st. This is Talk Today. I'm David Bull. Thank you very much indeed for your company this morning. Now, as you would expect, I have great news for you <laughs> this morning. Yes, it is International Day of the Nacho. <laughs> It is also Back to the Future Day. 
Yeah, remember that? What a great movie, Back to the Future. Also, it's the Supreme Cat Show, and it's on in Warwickshire. Yeah! <laughs> yes, the Supreme Cat Show. Right, let's start today's show, shall we? Today's fascinating facts. Right, today's fascinating facts. On this day in 1805, at the Battle of Trafalgar, Nelson gave his famous signal. That was England Expects, which, uh, which flew from HMS Victory shortly after 11 o'clock on this very day. Now, the British actually won this important battle against Napoleon's combined French and Spanish fleets, uh, leaving Britain's navy unchallenged until the 20th century. Very sadly, of course, Nelson was killed on this day in 1805 and the victory that is Nelson's flagship is now preserved in Portsmouth. On this day in 1868 Sir Ernest Dunlop Swinton the English inventor of the military tank was born and on this day in 1958 the first women peers were introduced in the House of Lords and those are today's fascinating facts. Talking of baronesses, uh, Claire Muldoon joins me this morning. Good morning to you. Uh, what was segue was that from a baroness <laughs> to be Claire a great, Muldoon? But you'd be a brilliant baroness. I would be, wouldn't I? That's what I mean. Yeah, ditch Michelle Moan, get me Well, in. I think you'd be great in the upper I'm house. so impressed by your facts of the day, David. Why? Because, did you realise this week there was a cat in England <laughs> that got the, it was in the Guinness Book of Records, I think, for the loudest purr. Yes, I did see that yeah. actually. Yes, and it was actually quite a sweet clip. I saw the the cat. It was it was really loud though, wasn't it? Oh, I don't know. I don't really like cats. <laughs> to be honest right. with you. So so did you like though Back to the Future the movie? I did. Mm. I really did. And that DeLorean car yes. made in Belfast, I think. Is that right? I think. I so. mean, I was obsessed with Back to the Future. Were now, you? Oh, absolutely obsessed. And that I think the first one must have been in the early 80s, actually. Yeah. Something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Now, the reason it's Back to the Future Day, do you know why it's Back to the Future Day? Um, no. Is it something to do with Rishi Sunak? No. Because, do you remember in the film? So this is in Back to the Future Part 2, which was released in 1989. It starts in 1985. Right. And they travel. This is Doc Brown. Do you remember yeah, Doc yeah, Brown? Yeah, yeah. Uh, also with Jennifer Parker. Uh, they travel to October. October the 21st, uh, 2015. That is the date. Do you remember on the computer yes, it said yes, to? Yes, yes, yes. so today is the Back to the Future wow. date. It's the day they actually travelled to. Right, let's move on, shall we, and talk about, obviously, much... Uh, sadder events. Obviously, the ongoing conflict in Israel and Gaza, I've spoken about it all week. Five Everyone th has. I mean, I'm exactly. sure, it, it, without wanting to be desensitised by anything, I think the, the, the fatigue is starting to kick in because we're not even mentioning Ukraine anymore, are we? Is, isn't that interesting? And isn't it? it, it? it I, I just find it. It's so fascinating. We still have this ongoing war yep. with Ukraine, with Russia. We're not talking about that. Mm -hmm. We're now talking about Hamas and Israel and mm. Gaza. It's very grave. It it's is. Just, it's very, very dark. And it's very, you know, the front pages were full of it for days on end uh, over these past two weeks. And, you know, no one has got a solution. Everyone mm. thinks they know what's going on and everyone thinks they've got the solution. Well, well, let's just move on. And for those people just waking up this morning, let me just tell you the latest news. An American mother and daughter became the first hostages to mm. be freed by Hamas. Uh, this was last night, actually, as a series of uh, a sign of goodwill. They were identified by the Israeli military as Judith Rahnan, who is believed to be in her 60s, mm. her 17-year-old daughter, Natalie. Now, they were visiting family living in a kibbutz close to the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. Now, now, uh, the President of the United States says that clearly they've had a terrible ordeal. I think just in terms of, of what this means, many people are saying, well, maybe this is a, a chink of light. Yeah. That maybe, because we think there are 250 ha hostages being held, is this a chink of light? Does it mean that Hamas is ready to do some sort of deal? And, and I guess... At the same time, we've got all of this humanitarian aid sitting, waiting to mm -hmm. get into mm -hmm. Gaza. Mm -hmm. We've got the politics of Egypt. You've also got, mm -hmm. and this is the most interesting thing for me, is the role of Qatar. Qatar is crucial in brokering whatever deal is done. And that is down to Trump, because he got some of the United Arab Emirates countries to soften um, the, the trade with Israel. And he was he was very much a, a kingpin in that in in brokering those deals to soften up the relations between uh, the UEA and um, Israel. Now 
a chink of light, I don't know. But look at it domestically, though, David. We had the head of MI5, MI6 as well, saying about the, the security aspect mm. of um, the, the potential threat that Hamas struck ISIS could have on our soil, on British mm. soil, well, I'm because glad of you, all I'm, of this. Well, I'm glad you, you've, you've brought this up. An asylum seeker bent on avenging deaths in Gaza has carried out a suspected terrorist yeah. attack here in the UK. It was inevitable. I think that's right. Now, the public has not been told that the man who came to the UK just three years ago in 2020 told police he'd done this terrorist act for Palestine in the name of Palestine. And MPs are saying the public has a right to know who this man is, what the terrorist attack was. And I think we should know. Absolutely we should. And it's not... The, the, the issue I have with all of this cloak and dagger and the skullduggery, I would say, of not owning up to what we have in the country is the fact that people, you're, you're branded racist or you're branded unsympathetic to refugees or you're branded a myriad of, of name callings, basically, if you do not think that, you know, we should open our borders and let everybody in. This is what happens when people are not processed fully enough. We've got enough crime in our own, with, with our own citizens as it is. And, and, and this not is, enough um, prison cells Well, this either. is what people are saying across Europe, actually. The fact is that, obviously, we saw a Tunisian man shooting dead those two Swedish football fans in, yes, Brussels. in Brussels. He'd come in... Stabbed, by, no? Shoot, well, he, shot? There was, uh, who shot them. Yeah. Um, but it um, came in as an illegal migrant through via Lampedusa. This is in Italy. Italy. So we're starting to see a huge political backlash against the state of illegal migrants in this country. Yeah. And and Rishi Sunak has made this one of his pledges, hasn't he? The yes. five pledges, we're going to stop the boats. It's not happening. As a result, the risk to this country increases. Yeah. We've heard today there are pro-Palestinian marches taking place today. The government is now, or, or JTAC, is looking at raising the terror, terror threat th yeah. to critical. Yeah. I mean, that is huge. I mean, we're only starting now to be able to fly. There's two airports in this in, in the UK that you don't need to check the 100 mil uh, fluid, of course. That all came in after 9-11, remember? It did. I mean, all the security, put plastic bags. I mean, I thought we were supposed to be so green now, we're doing away with plastics, and yet they still insist to do it. So we've only reached a point now, in terms of air travel at least, that we don't need a, as much security as possible. It's going to go back. It's, we're going backwards instead of forwards. And where do you stand on this, the, the, the Met's response? So the, the people marching in, in favour of Palestine are chanting, from the river to the sea, Palestine mm. will be free. Now, for many Israelis mm -hmm. and many Jewish people, mm -hmm. this is absolutely intolerable mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. thought to mean the complete obliteration of Israel. Yep. Now, the Met Police has said, we're not going to ban it, despite the Home Secretary saying, you should <coughs> really have zero tolerance for this chanting. I don't understand this, because if you, um, if, if someone, and this has happened, if someone were to stand outside, see a family planning clinic or an abortion clinic, and see um, pray or whatever, they could be taken away as thought crime and arrested and people have been and yet you could chant something that is deemed to be very anti-semitic and get away with it so so but then at the same time well so then the question is is it anti-semitic also don't we believe in freedom of speech there's well, a very fine line here huge fine line and the minute you start making it like th if you think it then you're arrested because that's bordering on sentient mm. ai robots mm. it's it, i can't even believe we're talking about this it's incredible I, I think for most people who are, are waking up having breakfast now at 12 minutes past seven, they're thinking, what on earth is happening to this yeah, country? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the, well, well, I think the country is becoming unrecognisable. And also, I think, you know, back to um, Hamas and Israel as the state, it's incredibly difficult to, if you were to broker any criticism, be it constructive criticism, or if you were to raise any points about, you know, the, uh, of what Netanyahu is doing or anything, then you're deemed anti-Semitic as well. So it's incredibly difficult to try and speak um, openly, speak fluently about and dispassionately mm. about it without being labelled as something. Well, so we're going to talk more about Israel at 8 o'clock this morning. I'm going to be talking to Colonel Simon Diggins, OBE, retired British Army Colonel. He's really mm. good, defence an analyst as well, about where we are, what the release of these hostages mean, in terms of what happens with the ground incursion. And what the optic is. The optic, what's the end game? Yes. I mean, America says they're not even sure that Israel knows what the end game is. Mm.
Anyway, let's move on and talk about politics because, of course, the Conservatives were wiped out pretty yeah. much. I did breakfast yesterday talking about the swing, 20% swing, 20.9% mm. swing, 23% swing. This is a disaster for the Conservative Party. Mid Bedfordshire snatched from Conservative hands for the first time in nearly 100 years in a deeply disturbing blow to Rishi Sunak. Now, what does this mean? Well, if you extrapolate this, it means Labour, if they if they carry on like this, yeah. the third by-election victory, if they carry on like this, they could end up with a huge majority, something we haven't seen since 97, something like a 170-seat majority. What are the Conservatives playing at? Well, can we even call them Conservatives anymore? Because they clearly don't have any Conservative policies. They're not for the working person. They're not for uh, those that might have a lot of money. They're not for those that need a bit of help from the state. They're, they seem to be helping no one other than themselves. How much was Rishi's three month uh, jet bill? £650,000. Mm. Well, he says he's busy, he needs to get around. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not like that, he doesn't. <laughs> I mean, I, I, Sort out the trains, well, Rishi, and go by train. Well, well, there's that. I'm, there's a lot of talk, and we'll talk about this later as well, a lot of talk about the giveaways before the general election, whether we will have tax breaks or inheritance tax, all this stuff. But all I hear is words. I know, I know, I know. It's rhetoric all the time. And I'll tell you, that's not an optic that looks good. No, it really isn't. Uh, also, um, this is an interesting article, and I will say this. Conservative voters who felt they couldn't vote Conservative yeah. have moved to support Reform UK. When you look at those seats, if you added the Conservative vote and Reform UK's vote... They're more vote, than Labour, I bet. ...it would then be Labour. So the Conservative Party very nervous now about the role of Reform UK. Now, the Reform UK, and Richard Tice has been on record this week saying, our aim is to destroy the Conservative government because it's not being Conservative. Mm. And at the same time, people are saying, well, I'm actually going to change the way I vote for the first time. I welcome that in that I want people to vote positively. I, th I absolutely agree. And we have discussed this till the cows come <laughs> home. I mean, the domestic uh, current situation of politics in this country is absolutely dire and I include Scotland and Wales in that because your viewers and your listeners will know how deeply offended I am by what's happening mm -hmm. in these regionally devolved governments. Um, but the, the bigger picture though in terms of governing the country from Westminster is, is absolutely dire and I think Nigel Farage will be one to watch because he's not pinned his sail to any mast yet, has he? No. He's, well, I mean, uh, Nigel Farage is the honorary president of Reform UK. Right. He says he is not going to the Conservatives. He's staying very much with, with Reform UK. With his Union UK. Jack socks sitting with in the front nothing, row. Nothing, and nothing wrong with Union Jack. N nothing the Conservative wrong with Party conference. Well, well, I agree with that. Um, it is interesting, though, and when you look at the election campaigning mm. the Conservatives did, they even, some of the local associations, then started attacking Reform UK mm. because they realised that actually that's their biggest threat. And also, I mean, the Conservatives have, you know, we, we, they, they just mealy mouth make these statements. And yet, uh, in Monday of last week, it was recorded that we don't have enough prison cells. You know, and the, the Conservatives now, who used to be for law and order and mm. policing and public safety, are saying, well, we can actually let low um, low level criminals out of prison and put them into this into society mm. so to work me, it off. Well, let me just throw this open to people at home because it's made me think whether we've seen the starting gun being fired on the general election. If you were Rishi Sunak, mm. when would you call a general election? Would you call it now? Would you wait until the spring? Would you leave it to the last possible moment? The number 0344 499 1000. Text the word TALK and your message to 87222. You can tweet us at TALK TV. Don't forget, at TALK TV, then space... Uh, then hashtag breakfast doctors. <laughs> then it will come to us. Oh, I need to tell you how to be uh, in charge of that. Um, yeah. And um, when should he call the election? I, I think he needs to. I, I would do it as soon as possible because they're over. They're finished. And just to stop, but, but all no. This so, so he will say, "Well, I'm going to hang on of because he'll say well, that. I'm going to get inflation under control. We'll see the Supreme Court ruling on the boats. He we'll can't actually... get inflation under control when he's committed to 2050 for net zero, for heaven's sake." That's a big factor in it. I agree. The question is, well, the Conservatives could have another leader. I mean, I don't think they'd do oh, that. Another unelected leader? 
How many leaders have we had? <laughs> They're and not leaders, David. Don't call them leaders. Right, OK, that's me told. Right, let's move on. And um, uh, this is a story I thought you'd absolutely love. Uh, BBC show called The yeah. Midwife. Do you like it? I do. I, I don't really like it now. I loved it when it first started. Well, apparently, according to academics, it should have a health warning. Oh, for heaven's <laughs> sake! <laughs> because, Why? Because it's showing outdated and inaccurate birthing practices. Oh, and for they heaven's could, sake. They could be in, misinterpreted by people who are watching. That's I, shocking. Well, Absolutely I read, I, I read this. This came from... Uh, they basically looked at Call the Midwife. They then looked at guidelines from the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence and said that, essentially, the two didn't accord. It's a drama! drama. Absolutely. Next, they'll be adopting the Scottish <laughs> um, government's um, use of saline water as an injection for pain relief during labour to cut down on nitrous oxide. Figure. Go figure. <laughs> Ridiculous. Uh, I mean, I do wonder what's going on. Also, just in terms of woke stories today, this Who is. Who looks at Call the Midwife as a woman and thinks, I want that for my labour plan? Well, it's a very my good birthing point. Plan. It's a very good point. There was a professor, Susan Bewley, Professor Emeritus of OBS and Women's Health at King's College. And, and she, uh, I think the quote is, these inaccurate dis depictions could influence how people see real world care. Ridiculous. Utterly, utterly <laughs> infantilization, ridiculous. And the only positive thing about that is the word woman. Thank goodness that's in and not person. <laughs> Well said. Now, I then saw another story in Cardiff University. Uh, Students' Union, you know they're clamping down on behaviour and uh, thought police. You can't actually have a, you know, be able to, to think what you like. Blue shirts and chinos have been banned by a <gasps> university students' union due to dangerous behaviour by some students. Cardiff University Students' Union said people wearing... That's my wearing... son's staple up at Newcastle. Is it? Isn't that what young people wear? Yes. Um, said people wearing the outfit, which is a typically associated with sports club, would well, be rugby. refused entry to its Wednesday club night called YOLO. It comes after reckless, dangerous and incredibly irresponsible behaviour by a group of male students in the queue. Shouldn't the universities be concentrating on giving on them an education and freedom of thought. speech? Academic thought, critical thinking, and the ability to tease out an argument and have both sides of the argument brought together in a tutorial, face to face, not over Zoom. So, so I, I mean, I've, you, you know, my two youngest are at university. Mm. One at Leeds and up, up at New, one Tom's up at Newcastle, and chinos and, and shirts are a staple. He's a rugby lad, <laughs> and you know, and he anyway, and the amount of. Misandry, misogyny, and the inability. Actually, there's a lot of students who are frightened to to make their views heard, and that's the whole point. I think of a tertiary education, a, a good solid university, the ability to think out loud mm. and actually, you know, morph and change your view if need be, but have that view and have those principles. Uh, and for Cardiff now to turn around and say that you can't wear a certain type of clothing. <laughs> it's preposterous. Well, also, I just, I'm deeply it's nervous just... that the students are so cosseted in these artificial oh, they, they environments. Are. So, so it's really interesting, actually, even in this uh, industry as well, I don't see the work ethic. So no. young people expect everything. I've just arrived from university. I now expect to be on a great salary and I want to only do a three-day week. Well, guess what? You have to work for it. And you know what else? Some of them can't even make a blooming cup of coffee. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Not looking at anyone in there. No. 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 Absolutely. They're, they're, not. No, they're they're too old. <laughs> That's just filled with Damien's not in there. No, Damien's not there. Not there today. Uh, Claire, thank you very much. Uh, oh, you're in, welcome. Indeed. So, so I'm just asking that question this morning, just in terms of the election. Rishi Sunak can call it now whenever he wants. We've got rid of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. The question is, when should he call it? Obviously, the polls are very much against him. Should he call it now and put us out of our misery? Should he wait until the spring? That's quite a good time to do it because the weather's better. Imagine doing it over the winter. That would be absolutely horrific and no one would go out. Or do you leave it to the last possible moment, hoping, uh, desperately hoping, that you can turn around the fortunes of this country? The number 0344 499 1000. Text the word talk in your message to 8722. You can tweet us at Talk TV, leave a space, then hashtag Breakfast Doctors, and I've got Muldoon manning the phones. You need to say it properly. I did. No, the way you normally Muldoon. say it. Muldoon! <laughs> Muldoon! Right. This is Talk TV.
Welcome back to Talk Today with me, David Bull. The time 7.26 now on Saturday, October the 21st. Thank you very much indeed for all your comments. Where's Renee, says Robert in North Ants. Well, she's sunning her particles still. I that was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> the lovely Claire Muldoon uh, joins me all morning uh, this morning. Having a nice time? I'm having a lovely time, Good. as always. Good, I'm very pleased. We should have some champagne or box fizz, though. Phil, I Phil? want champagne. <laughs> yes, I agree. A champagne breakfast. Uh, David... <laughs> Uh, it says Jill in St Albans. Oh, no, so it, Jill it says here, but it's actually Alison. Um, David, regrettably, I want to vote for Reform UK, but I can't risk doing this as it will split the right-wing vote and allow Labour in and or a role for the Lib Dems. Reform's best strategy would be to put all its resources into getting Farage into Parliament by targeting an optimum seat. At least then his voice will be heard. Opposition made to Labour and its open-door policy. Keep up the good work. Always try to tune into your programmes. Thank you very much indeed for that. Alison. Uh, is there such a thing as a man peer? Because you said a woman peer. I actually said a female peer, I yeah. think. If it doesn't sound right when people say woman prime minister either, is Rishi Sunak a man prime minister? Well, he's a male prime minister, isn't he? Interested to know he's if it's grammatically... He's not a prime minister, really, is he? <laughs> <laughs> Interested to know if it's grammatically correct to use man and woman instead of male and female. I think, Liz, it's male and female. Uh, I stand corrected. Uh, hi, David, says Tony in Liverpool, one of our regulars. Good morning to you, Tony. Uh, we'll see a wave of terrorist attacks across Europe and America. The UK government calls terrorists mentally ill. We are not stupid. I think there's real concern about what is going on in this country. There is. There really is, and I don't like keeping a lid on things like this in terms of comms for um, the UK population. Mm. I think as citizens, we've got a right to know. I do too. Uh, right, let's move on. It's time for this morning's papers. Joining us this morning is Rob Merrick, who is a political journalist. Very good morning to you. Good morning. Really good to see you. Thank you, you very too. much indeed for coming in. Now, you've chosen some, some good, good corking stories this morning. Good. Where do you want to start? Shall we start with the mail? Uh, yes. So uh, this this is about being banned from a student union, which I sort of touched on earlier. Just just tell us more about that. Yeah, I know you just talked about this, but I was hoping I could provide a little bit more insight. Go on then. Uh, so, 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 so Car Cardiff is my hometown. Oh, right. So obviously it, it leapt out when I saw that it was Cardiff Students Union imposing what I agree is this absolutely <laughs> ludicrous ban. On so a certain so type essentially, of for people who've just tuned in, mm. they've from what I understand, they've banned a certain dress code in the mm. student union, which I don't think is particularly out outrageous and that dress code is chinos and blue shirts now i know i'm wearing a blue shirt myself at the moment <laughs> but i'm not wearing chinos so i might just get away with it right. if i was standing in yeah. the student queue in, in cardiff so apparently this uh, this attire has been linked closely with very very bad behavior in particular in the queue to get into uh, into the student union and therefore by banning this clothing they can prevent disorder <laughs> says the student <laughs> union not preventing the actual lad that's dressed like that though are they well, i'm just repeating what they say according to the newspapers and they claim some success Yes, already. I mean, well, I, again, I find this highly unlikely, but I think we all agree that we can't be in the business of banning people from wearing common clothing just because it's allegedly but, linked to disorder. Unless I've got this wrong, blue shirts and chinos it is very smart. Mm. It's a casual look. It's not as though they're going in in sort of heavy metal emblems mm. or inappropriately dressed, is it? It isn't, no. I suppose, the, if, if I can just have a tinge of sympathy, I suppose we, if anyone who went to university can remember that so-called rugger-buggers are the worst type of... are the people you're going to most likely run into trouble with, aren't they? I suppose it's, it's, it's the group of people who, uh, who, who look as if they, you know, they, they are these, these sort of rugger-buggers. Unless you're a loose-head just... prop or a hooker. I don't think it's just the loose head props. I, mean, I think back to my days, and uh, I knew plenty of rugby buggers who, well, uh, who played I th I them back better, on the pitch. Let, let's steer away from the, the, mm. fight, the word, that word, that particular word. But I went to a rugby playing medical school. There's no doubt that the rugby boys were of a certain mm. type. And but actually, it was it was all mouth really. Yes. I, I think they 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 thought they were intimidating. They weren't. Mm. I would like to see the evidence that a drop in disorder is, <laughs> is linked to banning uh, the wearing of chinos and blue well, shirts. I, tell you what I am do. sceptical of that. Right. With, with Halloween coming up, they should all dress in chinos and shirts to see <laughs> where that gets them as fancy dress. And, and a pumpkin. Um, <laughs> or a turnip. Or, or a turnip. Yes. A neep. Yes. Oh, yes. So, so this morning I said that you were coming with uh, haggis and neeps. Well, no, so that was also correct. Oh, yes, yeah, so you say. I wrote neeps and tatties, but anyway. Um, which you need whiskey on, by the way. Yeah, I know. OK, just telling yeah. you. Just telling you. Uh, right, let's move on to your second story. This is in The, the Times this morning. Uh, this is about Maloney. 
Yes, an extraordinary story, isn't it? So we're probably used to, you know, misbehaving, or at least, you know, it's political spouses in this country who create the potential for embarrassment for the Prime Minister, thinking back as long as Dennis Thatcher, you know, drank too much gin and, uh, you know, Cherie Blair had some shady property dealings and uh, we learned recently of course that Carrie Johnson was trying to run the country when it came mm -hmm. to Covid <laughs> policy uh, rather than I her, think she her did run the country. Did. <laughs> well I didn't think anyone was running the country. Well that's she also did. true. But she may have come closer than her, her hapless husband that's true but I don't think anyone in Britain can have matched uh, the extraordinary story of uh, Giorgio Maloney's husband who was caught on a secret tape of you know planning or plotting a threesome possibly even a foursome right. one of the tabloids uh, claims this morning he's a T he works in TV and uh, when these tapes were exposed Exposed, uh, Georgia, the Prime Minister, has uh, has given him the boot. They have a, at least, I think, one child together, so it's obviously a long term relationship. Yeah, that's right, a seven year old daughter. Out the door. But I suppose what occurs to me now is that, I mean, well, nobody knows more about you than your spouse, your partner, or or your former partner. So I guess she, she will be hoping that he's not going to uh, spill any beans, that he's not taking it too badly, I suppose. No, uh, so this is Andrea Gianbruno, the father of uh, the Italian Prime Minister's seven-year-old daughter, appeared more intent on wooing his female work colleagues this week. Uh, as you say, asking for a threesome, I didn't read about the foursome, but obviously it gets more and more intriguing. Um, so Maloney then said it was the final straw. She announced on Instagram that the relationship uh, was over. Maloney's a really interesting mm. politician, actually, I think. I think she and Sunak have st struck up something of a bond. Yes, I mean, she's described as a post-fascist, isn't he? So she, isn't she? So her party, you know, has links to Mussolini. It was born out of Mussolini's fascist. She claims to have moved on from uh, from those days that she's right of centre and not a fascist. Uh, she seems to have been embraced, you know, by other EU leaders, in particular Sunak, because, of course, they have the same very hardline mm. immigration policy. And so they are working together to try to persuade the rest of the EU to take uh, similar draconian action. Well, so, so we talk a great deal about the migrant crisis. Mm -hmm. We talk talked about it right mm -hmm. at the beginning of the program mm -hmm. but we think we've got a tricky time 44,000 came in last year here into Italy 175,000 in Lampedusa and Lampedusa 10,000 yeah. alone to a tiny island yeah. I mean it's unsustainable isn't it well, of course, if you are in Rome or in many other European countries and you look at our so-called migrant crisis in this country, and it looks like, like small beans, doesn't it, mm -hmm. without a doubt, because you say there were vastly mm -hmm. increased numbers, a much more dangerous crossing, of course, a much longer crossing. Many, many more people have died making that crossing than, you know, the, the people that we've lost in the, in the channel here. Um, whether there really is any sort of parallel between what Britain is trying to do and what Italy needs to do, or the European countries, and whether somehow they can work together. I'm sceptical. I, I think that Sunak sees political advantage when he goes to European gather gatherings to talk about the small boats crisis and to be trying to argue that he's doing something about it on a broader level. Well, so so when I was in the European Parliament, we had close links with the mm. AFD, which is uh, the German party. This is what I don't think people realise, is that the EU or the political parties within the EU are fragmenting. There isn't this unitary stance mm. on lots of things, and all the countries are facing very similar challenges. I'm just wondering, and there are a lot of articles written about where the EU goes from here. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts? Wow, I wasn't expecting Sorry. to be asked that one this morning. Well, well I just wonder, goes... do you see what? it as a, a unifying body? Because what it wants is f to be a federal state. It wants to be a si essentially a supranational government. It wants one government, one army. We see that the whole time. I suppose my thoughts are these. Um, for a long time, people have liked to claim that the EU is in crisis, you know, some sort of permanent crisis, that it might fall apart. There were many claims that Brexit would lead to other European countries wishing to do the same. Instead, of course, the opposite happened. Uh, other right of centre parties uh, and voters in the EU saw the disastrous Brexit and thought we don't want any of that and everybody's walked well, away well, from it. Well, it's only and disastrous it's, because uh, we haven't Brexited. That's probably a slightly different discussion. But the um, the EU is actually on an uptick, isn't it? If you look at the Polish election results... Is it? In the last few, yes, it is, Go because... On. Uh, one of the bigger threats to the EU's unity was the very right-wing government in Poland, which has just been kicked out and will be replaced by a former chair of the European Council, someone who wants to I mean, work with the EU. Poland's an enormously important country. Well, well, indeed, but actually when you look at the economy of Europe, it's actually in decline. The fact is that the EU, I think, is in serious trouble, Claire. I agree with you. And I think, you know, the... the I also agree with what you've just said, Rob, because the, I watched the elections in Poland quite closely and I, I was surprised, actually. I didn't think that... Uh, is it Vesky? Vasky? 
Norm, uh, the, the new president of uh, Poland, Tusk. T Tusk, sorry, Tusk. Yes, would, Donald Tusk, who, who I know from the EP. Yeah, yeah, I didn't actually think he would win. Mm. And the, the, the symbolism, there was a lot of uh, young girls, young women and young men dressed in white T-shirts. Uh, you know, the symbolism of the colours of Poland and the Polish flag, they still were quite passionate and represented Poland, I think. Um, so maybe there is a, a, a shift going I mean, on. Yeah, I mean, I think... Germany I, will be quite close to watch Well, as well. I think it's going to be interesting just watching the migrant crisis unfold. It is clearly an issue if we've got a million people, or more than a million people, yeah. millions of people on the move across the world. And it's just in terms of every sovereign nation, how do you prepare for an influx of people when you can't build schools and hospitals, infrastructure? Yeah. It's impossible for any country. I don't disagree with you, David. There are massive challenges, and of course, the, the EU has has huge problems in many areas. But I think its its state of crisis is always exaggerated. You know, I mean, you will know better than me because you've been there. I have I, you know, been, I have yeah. not been a member of the European <laughs> Parliament, so so I would bow to your superior knowledge there. But my sense is that the the forces that want to keep the EU together, in particular its biggest players in France and Germany, uh, outplay. The, the you know the people who want to pull it apart and the crisis that might cause that it will stay together. Mm. It'll be interesting to see what happens next in terms of accession states, for example, mm. and, uh, and and uh, money fiscally how it will how it will continue. Well, that's a very good point. In global indeed. decline. Uh, let's let's move on and talk about obviously Israel and what's happening with Hamas. We've got three hundred thousand soldiers amassing on the border of Gaza. Obviously, we're waiting for that to happen. The front page of the Times: Hamas frees kidnapped mother and daughter. That is wonderful news. Of course, 250 people being held hostage, we believe. But also the ramifications here. You and I spoke mm -hmm. right at the beginning of P uh, the police worried or the JTAC worried about the risk of terrorism in this country, mm -hmm. possibly raising the threat level to critical uh, this weekend. The marches that uh, the pro-Palestine marches that I believe are happening today my Jewish friends have been terrified by what is going on uh, in this country. Also, this sense almost of lawlessness. Tell us about your next story because it feeds into that. Yeah, it sort of feels like a really important day today, both in Israel, Palestine, and in this country as well, on, on a sort of smaller scale, I suppose. I mean, you know, will the trucks finally get in to develop to, to this? This is this the humanitarian, humanitarian aid, aid. Yeah. through the co crossing from Egypt. You know, it, it, it's been held back for days. You could see the despair of the UN Secretary General that these trucks were not being allowed in. We're told there's optimism they finally will today. So we'll see whether that happens. And in this country, of course, we have further demonstration brought by pro-Palestine groups. I mean, last week when the demonstrations took place, some idiots turned up. There are always some extremists at these gatherings. Mm -hmm. Some offensive things happened. But I think most people agree it was on a fairly small scale. You know, the, in the main, the demonstrations were peaceful and well observed. Uh, I, th I think people in the police were relieved about that. We see whether that happens again I mean, I, today I, I, or whether I, the problems are worse. I don't think they should have been allowed anywhere near the cenotaph. I think that was a terrible mistake. I mm. think they are now moving today to avoid that. And of course, we saw those pictures of police helmets being put on the cenotaph. Mm. I said mm. discarded last week, but mm. put on the cenotaph. And many people said that was just so terrible, as a, a terrible sort of, um, it, just mm. in terms of not honouring the war dead. Th there is a very fine line here here isn't there between protest which we believe in free speech which we believe in and chance which incite people so where do you stand on from the river to the sea Palestine will be free which is translated for many people many Jewish people meaning the destruction of Israel well, I don't think it's for me to say where I stand, and I'm not sure that the should viewers we would be interested in my opinion but on if, it. But should but we ban I, it? I think. Well, as I say, I'm not here to give my opinion on that, but I, but I, I think what I would, my opinion is that the police appear to be handling the issue sensitively from either side. That, that's my impression. I.e., they will not allow um, provocative gestures outside synagogues. That appears to me to be a very sensible and the right decision. Or, for example, outside the Israeli embassy. Um, on the other side of the argument, of course, the Home Secretary wants anyone to be banned from using but, that But I don't public. understand the difference between chanting that outside a synagogue and chanting it in a London street. Well, I think the difference is obvious, isn't it? I no. mean, if you do it outside a synagogue or outside the Israeli embassy, outside somewhere where you know large numbers of Jewish people will be, then clearly... But there are lots of Jewish people in central London. 
Well, clearly it is more provocative if you do it outside a synagogue. That seems clear to me. I mean, clearly there are different interpretations of the chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Now, the Home Secretary believes that that is a description of people, by people who want to wipe out Israel altogether. She other said people it's give, widely accepted to be understood well, to mean Well, other people that. give completely different interpretations of those words, and I'm, but, but, I'm but, very but, pleased to live in a country but, where but, it is but, not up to the Home Secretary mm. unilaterally to decide what should take place on the streets I'm, I'm of just, London I'm just at protests intrigued. that should definitely but, be held because of our faith in free speech. But you're happy for it to be banned outside a synagogue? I'm saying I believe there is a difference between a, a get, protest... You need to get off the fence. Are you happy for it to be banned I don't need outside? to get off you the fence. You do need to get off the I fence. I'm not here to it's get off. It's called Talk TV, so that you have, you have to come up... You have I, to decide. Well, I said that I believe the police are handling it sensitively. That's my impression. Right. They are listening to both sides of the argument, and they are trying to achieve a middle ground. They are not simply doing what Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, who, whose biggest interest is being in the, ne the next leader of the Conservative Party, let's be clear. Uh, I think they think it's correct that they are not simply listening to what she says. They are listening to other voices and trying to find a sensitive middle way through. That is the bright approach, in my view. Claire? Well, I don't like the banning of anything, and mm. I grew no, up. No, I don't. I, I, and I grew up in in Glasgow when we had the orange walks, and I'm a practicing Catholic. <clears throat> we always took offence by it. And we never understood why on earth that could happen, but it, you know, it's it's historic and it happens. And Northern Ireland's even worse. And um, but I don't think things should be banned. Same way as I don't think um, rugger lads wearing chinos and a blue shirt should be banned. Mm. And I think we're going very much moving. The danger is moving into a very nanny state where we can we can can't say things or we can't dress away. We are very lucky to live in a country where we do have free speech. We're gifted free will and we only have to hope that we've got a moral compass that we use it all correctly. Claire and Rob, thank you for the moment. Let me hold you over the break if I may. Uh, we'll do some more stories after the break. Also, uh, time for your calls, your thoughts and your opinions. This is Talk TV. <laughs> Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Back wins? Us. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? Yeah. I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am Sands. not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> that's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. The one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus. Boris Johnson uh, isn't what he was. Most of them seem to have given up. Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. He's as up. fit as a butcher's dog. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. But the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, no, you're probably going to walk me off the show after saying this girl. I can't say, I'm not, I'm not a Swifty. Critics, I'd say me included, <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. 
How do you feel about that influence that you had? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. It was a fabulous dinner until you two uh, mooned us. <laughs> Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today with me, David Bull. The time 7.47 now on Saturday, October the 21st. 21st already, it's Halloween in 10 days. Um, joining us uh, this morning, Rob Merrick, political journalist, also Claire Muldoon, <laughs> is in with her neeps and tatties. Uh, is that a euphemism? <laughs> no, it isn't, it isn't. Uh, Rob, lots of messages. Uh, Rob Merrick is coming across as trying to hide his real opinions. Uh, please be honest. <laughs> I've never says... been accused of that in any point in my life. <laughs> uh, please be honest, says Paul. Pauline. Well said, Pauline. <laughs> I don't think that's my mum, but anyway. Uh, Rob is a mealy-mouthed apologist for Hamas. The police had better get a grip on these protests today if they're not biased, says Mick. And I, David... I, I, I find that quite offensive. I can just throw that in there. Fine. Uh, and David said... I do said, too, actually. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I, but, but Mick, obviously, what are you listening to? Right, I was going to say, but obviously this is the home of free speech, so you are entitled to say whatever you, you, you like. Uh, David, if you're Jewish, currently you're living in a state of complete terror when the British government are allowing hordes of pro-Palestinian and Hamas marches, because let's be honest, most of these people do support Hamas. Where is there to go? Where is there to turn to? Regards from Anna in Surrey. I do feel that there is a real disquiet in this country about the, the, the direction of travel in this country. What is going on? I think we mentioned this right mm -hmm, at the mm -hmm, beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm finding this is almost an unrecognisable country and surely any politician now needs to bring everyone together under the banner of being British, don't they? We need to have shared values. Of course, I think any successful politician has to be able to, to argue they're bringing the country together. I, th I think it's the only way to, to win uh, an election in, in this country. Um, I think when it comes to the Israel-Palestine mm. issue, and uh, by the way, I think Hamas committed an unspeakable they did. Uh, atrocity uh, in, in what it did. Um, but it's wrong to say that most people on these marches are supporters of Hamas. That's simply not the case. You know, there's a difference between uh, campaigners for uh, a Palestinian homeland uh, and Hamas. Um, going back to what we said before, on the, on the Hamas issue, I think, or the Israel-Palestine issue rather, I think what's fascinating though is that a poll yesterday showed that 76% of people in the UK want there to be an immediate ceasefire. And I know you want me to give me my opinion on everything, mm -hmm. but I'm not here to say whether it's right or wrong for Israel to carry out its invasion of Gaza, which is going to happen in the coming days, of course. That's not for me well, the to idea. say, but it is mm. a choice. It is not an, an inevitability. It is a choice when they do it. And I think it's interesting. I saw a footage uh, yesterday mm. of hundreds of Jewish people in Congress mm. who turned up to demand again, a ceasefire in Gaza. And it's, if 76% of Brits want a ceasefire, and yet all their political leaders have given the green light to Israel to invade the Gaza Strip. Well, I think that is I, a very interesting I, I'm not sure that's difference true. of opinion. I'm not sure that's true, actually. What, what, the, what the West has done is to say it stands by Israel and it's right to defend a sovereign democratic country. I think country. we know what that means, though. No, well, we don't necessarily, because mm. that's inference. So what the IDF has also said is it's not necessarily about a ground incursion. I agree with you. I think there are a lot of very difficult decisions to be made. My concern is there are civilian people on both sides caught up in the middle of this. And what happens next? And this is why I made the point that the US isn't sure what the end game is mm. for Israel. And, and, and I'm not sure Israel does mm. either. The, the good news for me is that obviously um, they have decided they would not, if they do invade, they wouldn't actually hold on to Gaza, that it would have to be self-governing, and that's the right thing, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, well, good luck with that. I mean, if that's the extent of their end game, then I suggest they need to do some further planning. It's much more complicated than that. It is complicated. That, isn't it? And, well, but, they want to eradicate mm, Hamas. That's mm, what they've said. But we, what I think we need to do, not that I'm involved, but is to have a proper permanent two-state solution, don't we? Mm. 
Uh, I think the fascinating thing about the eradicate Hamas thing is it was a really thoughtful speech that Biden gave in Israel, wasn't this week? Well, mm. you can see that he, while he's not going to stop them carrying out the invasion, that's clear, but he was also saying, <coughs> look at what happened after 9-11. Mm. The US invaded Iraq. It led to the Islamic State. It led to greater mm. suffering mm. and bloodshed and atrocity. And he clearly fears the same, <coughs> excuse me, from any attempt to eradicate Hamas, mm. Hamas rather than seek a political solution. Mm. Mm. Finally, let's do one more story, shall we, about the late Queen. What's the story? Well, I suppose it should be the biggest news of the day that the Queen is on page three of The Sun. <laughs> and I, I'm actually indebted to your producer who fed me that line before we came on air. He's like, good like I that. I wouldn't have thought of it myself. No, he's very good. Um, she, she's just in the corner of page three of The Sun, <laughs> we should point out. But no, it's, it's a lovely story. Everybody will remember that she you know, she filmed this this sketch for, for Paddington. Of course, she was 96 years old. You know, she was coming to the end of her life, but, uh, uh, but, but she filmed it and she had to uh, pull the marmalade Sani from her handbag and say, <laughs> uh, I keep mine in here to her, her grandchildren. Apparently it took her a few goes to get it right. Uh, again, that's probably understandable as he's A, not an actor, and B, was 96 yeah. years old. But uh, anyway, the, the, uh, the writer is paying tribute to her determination to plough on until, yeah. she, until she got it right. And apparently when he later complimented the Queen on being a great actor, she replied, well, I do it all the time. Oh, How brilliant, mm. how brilliant. It was such a fantastic mm. sketch. Rob, thank you very much indeed thank you. I'm for it. coming in. That's Rob Merrick, political journalist. Right, it's time for Tom Clayton's Sporting Weekend. Tom Clayton's Sporting Weekend. <laughs> Sorry, Tom, I'm late. It's, it's, it's all right. For know. the second week running, I'm late. I'm not blaming you. Let's put it that way. Oh, OK, okay. good. That's fine. Right, yeah. sport. Yes, let's talk about some sport. And uh, I think the only story in town at the moment is the Rugby World Cup. We saw um, a brilliant semi-final last night. Uh, I say brilliant, it was almost record-breaking between New Zealand and Argentina, the second highest ever winning margin in a Rugby World Cup semi-final. The, of course, highest winning margin is set by New Zealand in 1987. Of so course. They, uh, they are kind of the kings of the Rugby World Cup. They'll be in the final against the winner of tonight, England against South Africa. And uh, I think if you'd ask any... If you'd ask any rugby fan in the world who the final European or Northern Hemisphere team left in the Rugby World Cup at the, at the semi-final stage before the tournament began, that no one would have said England. Nope. Right. Because England had been... I think the nice way to put it is dreadful. <laughs> um, and you know, Is that I, a technical term? I, it is a technical yeah. term, yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, Ireland, world yeah. number one, by far the favourites. France, the world number two, and the host, and mm -hmm. the second favourites. Um, I think we were all expecting at least one of those two to make it into the semi-finals. Neither did. And England are here. It, it's kind of... No one really knows how they got there, but they did. Tom, I'm so pleased you've said that. And as a Scot, mm. it's not sour grapes at all. And maybe, Rob, you the same but being mm -hmm. Welshman that historically people will look back on this World Cup and think gosh the only Northern Hemisphere team to go through yeah. to the semis is England and they're going to think that must have been a great team they're not a great team oh they must have a great coach Borthwick isn't a great coach <laughs> I think they should have Sean Davis who's the the French yeah. uh, backs coach yeah. he should be yeah, I agree. I agree. I think to an extent, I do think Steve Borthwick. There is merit in his coaching. one good team, one good term at Leicester. But then at the same time, that was built over several years. He's only been given a year to turn this team around from what was a pretty dire situation under Eddie Jones. But I do understand. Oh, I, like I, mean, I understand coming from from a Scottish perspective, who were given the worst of oh. horrible draws. They had to face both Ireland and South Africa in the group stages. Right. So, um, and did, did you're a very laughing? Good time, no, I'm just you're laughing. I'm not laughing. Oh, Laughing in the face of adversity. <laughs> I'm, I'm yes, not, you are. I have enormous sympathy with no, our Scottish friends. Look, I feel like, as a, as a proud Englishman myself, yeah. I feel exactly that same level right. of sympathy, as I'm sure you would feel for us if we were in the same situation. <laughs> anyone but, but anyone right, say that? Right, so, so that's England facing South England, Africa. England, South Africa tonight. And fun fact, it's 16 years and one day since South Africa beat England in the final of the 2007 World Cup in the same stadium. Wow. Wow, that is a fun that. fact. Yeah. That's also, like a fascinating fact. Also, a second fascinating fact. Yeah. Yes. For you, this is only the second time in history that England and South Africa are facing each other in both professional rugby and professional cricket 
because in the cricket, England yeah. are playing South Africa at the Cricket World Cup. Now, I knew that because I did it yesterday. Right, uh, let's move on, shall we, and talk about women's rugby. Yes, we will, because this is a brand new tournament that's been launched for women's professional rugby internationally. Uh, it's, it's similar to the Nations League in football, so it's set out over three tiers with uh, essentially six in each of the best international uh, international teams. And uh, it's, I think it's really interesting. England uh, in the top tier, of course, they are one of the top teams in the world. New Zealand, France, Australia, Canada and Wales also mm. in there as well. So a bit of national pride there for Rob as well. <laughs> um, but no, it's split over three teams. There's a promotion and relegation system. I honestly think that's the way that we should go in men's professional rugby union as mm. well on the international stage. I think there has to be more to include lower tier nations. Yeah, I'd agree with that, actually. Also, we'll talk more about the Storm's horrific scenes yeah. up in Scotland, but also across, actually, the country, particularly East Anglia, where I'm from, and I'll talk about that later as well. Yeah. Uh, but just in terms of um, the Storm and weather generally, how does that affect, or how has it affected sporting teams? It's already had some pretty massive effects on sports already. We've seen a lot of race meetings cancelled throughout the week before the Storm even hit. Uh, we saw a match in the Championship called off last night when Rotherham were meant to host it, which that ended up getting... And, yes. off. Um, and you may remember yesterday there was an incident at Leeds Bradford uh, Airport, Airport. Mm, where, where the plane skidded off yeah, the, the runway. Yeah, the plane skidded off the runway. Well, Leeds United, my team, of course, causing a bit of concern. They were, me they were meant to fly to Norwich to go to uh, their match this afternoon, and effectively they couldn't take off yesterday, so they've had to drive down today. As an, uh, which I know is you know pales first in comparison. To, if it's a first world problem, but it just shows it's also. You know, travel of mm. of players is very important at this of stage, course. as well as, you know, just the actual safety of the fans. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you very much indeed, Tom. That thank was, you. of course. Uh, see you soon. See you uh, soon. That was, of course, Tom Clayton Sporting Weekend. Tom Clayton Sporting Weekend. Uh, lots and lots of messages uh, coming uh, in about that. Um, Rob, lots of people feel that you should have got off the feds, but this one is very nice about you. I'm with Rob. I'm with Rob. Perfectly logical. Whilst the Hamas attack was unforgivable, Israel does need to realise you can only kick a dog so many times before it bites. They simply practice apartheid in Israel. That's why. Um, we'll talk more about this, actually. It's a really complicated solution, of course, and I think what comes round time and time again is this has been ignored for so long and the question is, what Israel does now, and as Rob was saying, Biden has urged restraint in terms of what Israel does from here, but also in terms of a longer-term solution, to whether Gaza then becomes back under the Palestinian Authority with Mahmoud Abbas, and then what happens to the West Bank. I mean, it, it's a really difficult question uh, to, to solve or to answer, really. Uh, lots of other messages coming in. Hi, Dave. Great show, as always. Is Rob Merrick wearing chinos? That's Anthony in the West Midlands. <laughs> Jeans. Oh, right. OK, fine. Uh, lots of other messages as well. Keep all of those uh, coming in. Also, the question I'm asking this morning morning. When should Rishi Sunak call this election? Obviously, we saw these three by-election defeats. Obviously, the Conservative Party, a lot of hand-wringing. We're talking about changes they may make, of course, about inheritance tax, whether they're going to change the tax thresholds. Uh, also, the, some better economic news as well for the government. When should that election be called? Should it be called now? Should he wait, do it in the winter? That's pretty much a bad time to do it because it's raining. Uh, or should it be the spring? Or does he leave it to the last possible moment to to make sure that they have some sort of opportunity to turn this round. Let me know your thoughts, please. This is Talk Today. I'm David Bull. See you in a minute. This is Talk TV. Just when I was getting used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV. What just happened? I am furious.
Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on talk TV. Hello, a very good morning to you. It's just after 8 o'clock now on Saturday, October the 21st. This is Talk Today. I'm David Bull. Thank you very much indeed for your company. Great news for you this morning, as you would expect. It is International Day of the Nacho. <laughs> now, this is something I love. It's also Back to the Future Day. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant film. And the reason for that, by the way, is that's the date, October the 21st, 2015, is the date that clock was set for in the DeLorean. Yes, I'm a nerd. And it's great news because the Supreme Cat Show is on in Warwickshire. Yeah! <laughs> right, let's start today's show, shall we? Today's fascinating facts. And some goodies for you today. On this day in 1805, at the Battle of Trafalgar, Nate Nelson gave his famous signal. That was England Expects, which flew from HMS Victory shortly after 11 o'clock in the morning. Now, the British actually won this important battle against Napoleon's combined uh, French and Spanish fleets, leaving Britain's navy unchallenged until the 20th century. Nelson was very sadly killed. The Victory, that's Nelson's flagship, is now preserved in Portsmouth. On this day in 1868, Sir Ernest Dunlop Swinton was born. Now, who was he? He was the English inventor of the military tank. And on this day in 1958, the first female peers were introduced in the House of Lords. And those are today's fascinating facts. The wife's away, so I'm joined all morning by the lovely Claire Muldoon. Good morning, David. Good morning. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very much. Are you enjoying it so much? I'm well? loving it. Good. Loving it, keeping Renee's seat hot. Well, quite, quite. And what a seat. Uh, <laughs> I've got another fact for you, actually. Have you? On this day in 1997, Candle in the Wind became the biggest selling single in music history. That was the reworked version in tribute to Princess, Princess Diana. Diana. Did you see Bernie Taupin on Graham Norton's show a couple of weeks ago? I didn't. He spoke about rewriting that. Did he? Yeah, and it's unbelievable that actually it was... It, he was, you know, quite discombobulated mm. um, to the effect that it, won, it was on the number one hit list for so long. Mm. It's a great song. It is. It was beautiful, wasn't it? Done. Originally written for Marilyn Monroe. Yes. Yes, it yes, was. yes, yes, yes. By Elton John yeah. and Bernie Taupin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic song. Uh, lots of messages coming in uh, this morning. So, uh, in light of the three by-election defeats for the Conservative Party, a lot of mm. hand-wringing going mm. on at Conservative Central Office or whatever it's called these days, uh, and they're desperately trying to work out what to do in terms of how they turn this election around. If you read this morning's papers, there's lots of talk about lowering tax. Of course, we have the highest tax burden in 70 years. They're talking about maybe changing stamp duty to help people onto the housing ladder, mm -hmm. which would be a great thing. Mm -hmm. They're talking about inheritance tax. Here we go again. Mm -hmm. They talk about inheritance tax the whole time. It's all mouth. Nothing ever happens. But the Conservative Party in deep, deep trouble. Now, the question is for you this morning, what would you do if you were Rishi Sunak, apart from resign? What would you actually do? When would you call the election? Would you call it now and call everyone's bluff because a lot of people were saying the reason Labour won is because the Tory vote stayed at home rather than being a proactive positive vote for Labour. So when would you call that election? Would you call it now? Would you call it later in the year, although it's then rainy and dark and then people don't go out? Do you wait until the spring? Do you wait until the summer? until the last possible moment. Let me know. 0344 499 1000. Text the word talk in your message to 8722. You can also tweet us at Talk TV, then leave a space. Hashtag breakfast doctors. And I'm delighted to say that Claire Muldoon is manning I uh, am. the phone. Now, and what have we got? Peter Mullins actually used that very hashtag and the space breakfast doctors. And he said that Rishi Sunak won't be calling a general election this year, but he might call one in spring if he has achieved some progress on his five pledges by then, says Peter. Oh, I agree. Lots of people uh, talking about um, Palestine and the um, uh, 
protest marches here. Uh, Chris, uh, hashtag Breakfast Doctor, says, read the police not being prepared to act against anti-Semitic chanting. He said they are afraid due to the sheer numbers of those chanting and the risk of violence. Terrorism, this is the inevitable result of weak immigration policy and lack of checks, he says. Well, I agree. I absolutely agree. Also, it... I just didn't understand Rob's point, which is that the police are saying you can't chant that from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free in front of a, a synagogue, synagogue or a shul, but yeah. you can do it on the street, street of London, where there are Jewish people. I, saw, I could see his point, though, because it would, it would be more provocative, it would appear, if you knew that the concentration of the, the of Jews were in the shul, uh, sorry, synagogue, um, as opposed to being out in the street. Either way, it's it's awful language, mm. um, but I don't think it it should be banned mm. because I'm not in, I I am not a favour. I'm not in favour of banning things. I'm not. Uh, it's a complicated question. There it, but, are sensitivities. But, you know, there's lots of hand wringing because there's no accountability. If you use language like that, be accountable for it. Mm. Don't use it as a mask for something else. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just it's not right. Um, OK, well, um, let us know your thoughts on that as well, because yeah. obviously that's hashtag very much... breakfast doctors. The hashtag breakfast doctors, indeed. Uh, one for you, Claire. Scotsman, Welshman and an Irishman walk into the bar. Uh, where's the Englishman? He's still at the World Cup. Oh, that's actually quite funny. <laughs> I thought it was very good. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, whoever said, Who said that? that in. Um, I don't know, no, no, but tell us Locked. who you are. Blocked. <laughs> Blocked. <laughs> um, this is nice as well. No more GMTV for me. This show is bang on. Thank you very much indeed. Um, lots of other messages as well. Another fascinating fact, this one says, uh, on this day in 1975, I was born. Happy birthday to me. No name. How can I wish you happy birthday? But anyway, uh, thank you very much indeed for all of those. Let's move on now and talk about Israel, Hamas, uh, Gaza and some good news I suppose. Um, an American mother and daughter became the first hostages to be freed by Hamas. Uh, this is last night in a sign of goodwill. They were identified by the Israeli military as Judith Rana who is believed to be in her 60s. Also her 17 year old daughter Natalie who were visiting family near a kibbutz close to the Gaza Strip where Hamas attacked. Now Joe Biden rightfully said obviously they'd endured a terrible ordeal in the past 14 days. He said he was over Enjoyed. Also, what's interesting uh, for me, it seems that Qatar has played a really important role. I said during the week that mm. Qatar was going to be key to unlocking what was going on there. Uh, this came also after Rishi Sunak thanks, thanked the Qatari leaders for their efforts. Also, Rishi Sunak talking to Egypt as well. Let's talk about the latest that's happening over there with Colonel Simon Diggins, OBE, retired British Army Colonel and Defence Analyst. Good morning to you, Simon. Hey, good morning to you. Re really good to see you again. Thank you so much uh, for coming on this morning. This is some good news, of course. We spoke in the week about how tense this situation is. You've got something like 250 hostages being held. There were some chinks of light. Hamas saying they're willing to release some of these terrorists if Israel enters talks. Israel said, we are not entering talks. We've got 300,000 troops waiting on the border with Gaza. We've got a million, if not more, people moving uh, down towards the Rafah crossing. At the moment, we're in this period where we still haven't got humanitarian aid in, the troops haven't gone in, and people pleading with the leaders of Israel to think carefully. Simon, are you there? Oh, I've just lost Simon there. It, so, so just in terms mm. of where we are, it, it is a very complicated situation. What would you do if, if, um, if you were... Israel, because Israel does have a sovereign right, I think, to, to defend itself. What would you do? Think carefully? Well, yes. Um, and I, but I'm of the ilk. When this broke two weeks ago, um, it's, it happened on the same day, the 6th of October, 50 years to the day of the Yom Kippur War. That's right. And look what happened after that. Um, oil prices went up, the West went into recession, and you mentioned Qatar there. They're the ones with the oil. Um, so I think there's... 
I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not at all. I'm too much of a realist for that. However, I do think that everyone knows actually what's going on. And, you know, you, you, you rated Biden's speech there, but all I got from that take on Wednesday when he made his speech was when he made... I didn't the, rate he, his speech. Rob did. Well, when he referred to um, Hamas as the other team. I know. I mean, it's, it's just awful. I mean, I, to I think just... that it's very dangerous, I think, that he's in, he's in control of American politics. Well, let's ask Simon. He's back with us now. Simon, I was just saying this is so tense. You and I spoke about it in the week. We've got 300,000 troops amassing on the border with Gaza. We've got a million people moving towards the Rafa crossing. The humanitarian aid hasn't got in. We've now got some chinks of light here with Qatar brokering the release of this mother and daughter. We've still got 250 hostages being held. Hamas says they'll release the others, but only if it's... Israel enters talks, Israel says no. Israel's been told, think carefully about your next move. No, that's actually right. And I think they are thinking carefully about it. Um, and I think in this instance, the, the role of people like Rishi Sunak has been very helpful. I mean, not only reinforced Joe Biden's message about Israel being required to obey international humanitarian law, but his next conversation with, um, with the president of Egypt, with, with President Sisi, I think was also helpful and trying to understand what the position of Egypt and others were. Um, he then went on to Qatar and talked to the Qataris, they came, sorry, he talked to the Qataris in, actually in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and again, the, it's interesting, those sort of connections, people like the Qataris, the, the, the political leadership of Hamas are based in Qatar. Uh, and so they link with them the whole time. And if you also, there's another sort of bizarre connection, which is the, the, um, the Taliban were also based in, in, in Qatar as well. So Qatar's got this very interesting role where mm. it acts as a kind of broker uh, and we'll, we'll have conversations with people who others w won't do it. It's kind of, they have this sort of notion where they, they talk outside the room to each other. They don't they go, go in the same room together, but they'll talk to one set of people and they'll go and talk to another people. So we're in a very interesting, different and political stage uh, of the potential offensive as well. On top of that, an influential Saudi prince has issued a strong condemnation of Hamas and a rare rebuke um, from one of the Middle East main power broker as well. This is a Saudi ambassador, former Saudi ambassador to the U US and the UK. This is Prince Turkey Al Faisal. Uh, said he preferred civil insurrection and disobedience to the murderous tactics adopted by the Palestinian terror group. It is a very complicated situation in the Middle East, but if you've got Qatar willing to do that brokering, as you say, Hamas is based in Qatar, equally if you You've got other important forces within the Middle East saying this is not the way to proceed. Is, is, the, is that a, a good sign? It is a good sign because I think what people are now starting to do, you know, above and beyond complete horror at what Hamas did in, in, in southern Israel, people are saying actually we now need to think about the future. It's not just a matter of conducting a sort of a reprise or counter-offensive to, to get rid of Hamas, which everyone wants to do. But what happens next? You know, as you said, 1.1 million people displaced into southern Gaza. Uh, the Rafa crossing, we hope, is going to be open today to allow some aid to, to get through. But that still leaves the future of, of, of what happens in Gaza. And here the Israelis have already said, said what they're going to do. They have said that they see it as a three-phase operation. The first phase is ongoing at the moment. It's a bombing campaign. And then they say some kind of manoeuvre operation, which I take to be some kind of uh, attempt effectively to put the urban areas under siege. They'll then do a long protracted period where they will eliminate Hamas, and they'll do that very slowly. They'll take the time over that. But the third bit's a really interesting bit. This is a bit about the long term. Mm. They then effectively want to sort of turn Gaza into a, in, into an even more tightly controlled area and having some sort of security buffer zone inside Gaza, if you like, so a cordon sanitaire to keep Gazans away from there. And that's unclear then how Gaza survives. Because Gaza is still, in many respects, still reliant on Israel. We've seen what the effect has been of the removal of fuel, electricity and so forth. So how they get to that stage is going to be very complicated. Indeed. And and it was interesting. You and I spoke in the week as well about what the end game was. I think we talked about the fact the US didn't think that Israel actually had an end game. What has become clearer is that Israel says now it doesn't intend to occupy Gaza. Uh, it, it then said that essentially what they're trying to do is to hand over power to maybe the Palestinian Authority. Uh, they said they didn't want to control the besieged strip. What they've said is for those 2.4 million people, and remember the land mass of this is absolutely tiny. I keep saying it's the size of the Isle of Wight. The question is what happens now? And, and I think that, that will also help Israel's case internationally by saying we don't want to occupy Gaza. 
you know, I think I think it's essential from their perspective to to do that. It is interesting that they're now talking to to the Palestinian Authority and Mohammed Abbas. I mean, I mean, prior to the, this whole uh, this, uh, this whole campaign and the fighting, I mean Netanyahu's plan effectively was to divide them. So you had Hamas ruling ruling Gaza, and the, the, the supposed overall Palestinian Authority, run by Mohammed Abbas, was 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 being sidelined. And it was Netanyahu's, um, Netanyahu's approach was effectively to divide and rule. Um, and so they're now looking to Abbas to try, in fact, to, to be act as the as the de jure rather than just as the de, de, de facto ruler of the place. And that's going to be very interesting. We can actually get them back with the Palestinian Authority in charge in, in Gaza. And that will be complicated enough as well. So, so just in terms of how this works, though, the idea being that the Palestinian Authority would take control of Gaza, which they were in control of, weren't they, from 84 until 2000, 94 till 2006, yeah. there would then be this no-man's land around it to protect it. Does that mean the Palestinians, they, the Palestinian Authority then still controls the West Bank? What happens in the West Bank? Well, the West Bank is, is also complicated. I mean, they're hidden behind all of this, and, and everyone rightly is focused on the, on what's going on down in Gaza from all sorts of directions. Um, but there's no sign there of 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 any kind of understanding, I think, on behalf of some of the Israelis and Israeli settlers, that you know that they they cannot continue to treat the Palestinians with impunity. Some 80 Palestinians, and these are UN figures, these are UN figures, since since um, uh, since the 7th of October, some 80 Palestinians have been killed. Uh, in the West Bank by settlers and by um, by Israeli military. So this is low-level rumbling ins insurrection, disorder, um, and, and, and everything goes with that at the moment. So uh, the, there has got to be, and I think if this is one positive thing that comes out of this whole horror story, there mm. has got to be an attempt to have a comprehensive solution or get back on, into the place where they can have conversations about a comprehensive solution to look after the Palestinian people as well. Mm. I mean, nobody, nobody thinks of what Hamas did is, is, is right, except for the nutcases. But we now need to think, not for the long term, how are we going to look after you know, the people of Palestine, whether it be in the West Bank or in Gaza? And, and just in terms of a two-state solution, which has been kicked down the road for a very long time, I think actually it's fair to say Netanyahu didn't really want a two-state solution. I think it suited him domestically. That, that aside, how would, what would the two-state solution look like? Would it look like a single mass for the Palestinian people, one confluent country, or would it still be two distinct geographical areas? Simon's gone. <laughs> I think Simon has, has gone. I mean, just in terms of that, Claire, mm. for me, the answer has to be a two-state solution. It, I think they have kicked it down the They have, the road. but you have to question, why, why has it not been done before? There wasn't political will. They talked well, about it. They talked about it for, for years. But the Palestinians traditionally have been quite oppressed. Yes, I'd agree. Um, and, you know, the, the, there's talk of, you know, water being cut off, no electricity, and there is no planning permission in Palestine. If you look across the, 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 the wall, um, Israel's, uh, Israelis are able to build, uh, extend the properties. Palestinians aren't, and that is fact. So it's a very, it's a hugely contentious issue, and of course, Israel as itself is is the West's buffer to to to, to Russia, and Putin's been very quiet over this, hasn't he? Well, of course, and Jai, Jai Ping's not been saying anything either, nor has Modi even in India. I mean, this is huge globally. What's happening? Everyone, there's a diaspora of of, of Jews living all over the world. We need to take care of each other. And this is absolutely awful. And I can't believe there hasn't been a global outcry in this. All we're hearing about is Sunak, Biden and Netanyahu and the terrorists that are, that are, that are Hamas. But you make a great point because, of course, the whole thing was to do with, Isra yes. with Saudi fi um, doing this deal with Israel. Yes. That upsets Iran. Yes. Iran funds Iran's funding Hezbollah. this. Iran is funding and all of this. And who does that suit? It suits Russia. Yep. It suits yes. China. Yes. That's why they're yes. quiet. Yes. Mm. I'll tell you who's not quiet. Your but, viewers. Oh, your good. Your viewers. Breakfast, hashtag breakfast doctors. <laughs> uh, Robert says um, that um, don't let terrorist sympathisers um, put anything on the cenotaph. Quite Lots right. of people disagreeing with me, saying that the chant shouldn't be banned. Lots of people are saying, well, it should be banned. And Jamie well, so, so the reason I, I've been thinking about this, if, if I went down the street inciting hate yeah. by chanting something yeah. outrageous against women or, yeah. or, or minority yeah. communities or whatever, I would be stopped. Yes. 
Well, you wouldn't be... St people are too terrified now to stop people. Well, that's also true. Well, you know, Jamie says, um, hashtag breakfast doctor, so I can wander around London chanting from the river to the sea, Israel is a land for me. Jamie, no, I'm not saying do it. I'm saying but it ought not to be banned. And if anyone is sick enough to come out with this anti-Semitic trope like this, then they're really, really not very nice people. Uh, so many messages. Thank yeah, you. For, thank you for the moment. Lots of messages uh, coming in as well. Uh, Dr. David, this one says Israel should have retaliated straight away. Hamas started this by murdering hundreds at a music festival, and now Hamas want to talk. Uh, also, Noah says I think people sat in a far land who don't understand what it's like to live in Israel in normal times, constantly being shot at, rocks being thrown at you, suicide bombers crossing the border, constant tension. Imagine if Scotland attacked England and kills 1,400 people. How would you react? Would you sit and talk and show restraints? Israel have to destroy the Hamas capabilities and ability to attack in the future. You cannot talk to the organisation who want to wipe you off the planet. And I totally understand that. What I'm saying is that Israel needs to be smart because Hamas has booby-trapped those tunnels. They have planned Of course this. they have. They know what's of coming. Of course they have. And on that planning issue... Um, I don't. I just don't get the fact that Mossad and Netanyahu did not have an inkling that this was happening mm. or was about to happen. Uh, one more before the break. Brian says, uh, I'm all for free speech, but calling for the extermination of a certain race is dangerous. 1930s, etc. rhetoric shouldn't be allowed. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Is calling for the eradication of the Jewish state. They wouldn't get away with chanting death to all Jews, would they? It means exactly the same thing. Time for a break. After the break, it's head to head. Joining us this morning, Peter Edwards, uh, former editor of The Labour List. Also, Adam Stott, who is an entrepreneur. And this is Talk TV. We're here. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening. I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored, in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. <laughs> <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so <laughs> rich. But, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I am not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted new. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's that almost that like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. The one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus. Boris Johnson uh, isn't what he was. Most of them seem to have given up. Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. He's as up. fit as a butcher's dog. There he's, you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, no, you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying this <laughs> girl. <but laughs> Get around. Man. I can't say, I'm not, I'm not a Swifty. Critics, I'd say me included, <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, yeah. <laughs> Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. 
How do you feel about that influence that you had? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. It was a fabulous dinner until you two uh, mooned us. <laughs> Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today with me, David. Bull the time 8.27 now on Saturday, October the 21st. The wife's away, so Claire Muldoon... I am. <laughs> I am what? Here. Oh, good, yes, you are here, you are here, indeed. And uh, no mistaking that, no mistaking whatsoever. Um, we've been talking, obviously, about the Israel-Hamas conflict here. There is no answer to the Middle Eastern problem. The reason is, uh, says this one, Roy in Plymouth, from the day a baby is born, it is taught to hate anyone who has different beliefs to its parents. These beliefs go back decades, centuries, so nothing is going to change until all sides stop looking back as to what was and look forward to what could be. It's never going to happen. Oh, what religion does, what fun religion is when someone's God is better than someone else's God so that they may be eliminated. Just moving on to looking at other things. I've been asking this morning just in terms of where we are politically. Rishi Sunak, of course, uh, suffered three, has now suffered three by election defeats. And the question I asked this morning is, uh, when should he call an election? Should he do it now? Should he surprise them? We talked about the fact that when you look at those last by elections, it was less about supporting Labour. I think it was more about the Conservative vote staying at home. When should he call that election? Should it be now? Should he wait? When would you do it? Good morning, David, says uh, Jane. Rishi Sunak should resign immediately to save his party being trounced. His party should come first, but I really think it's too late for the Conservatives. He has taught the talk, but done nothing. I am dreading a Labour government because of the unchecked immigration and the Tony Blair legacy, which changed the entire face of our country, not for the better, forever. That is Jane in Mil Milton uh, Keynes. Lots of other messages coming in as well. But t do tell me, please, when you think that election should be called. Right, time to move on. It's time for Head to Head. Head to Head. Well, I'm delighted to say, joining me this morning, Peter Edwards, former editor of The Labour List, and Adam Stott, who is an entrepreneur. Good morning to Good the morning. two of you. Right, let's start, shall we, with uh, the, the election results. So the Tories have lost mid-Bedfordshire for the first time in almost 100 years. Mid-Bedfordshire snatched from the Conservatives uh, as a result of this. I mean, it was a devastating night for the Conservatives. When you actually uh, dive into this, and, and I'll start with you, Peter, um, representing Labour, but... Um, Keir Starmer saying this is a triumph, the Labour Party is on the way back, look, I'm about to be Prime Minister. When you actually look into this, the swings were enormous, 23.9% in Tamworth, you had a swing of 20.5% in mid-beds. But looking at the actual vote, wasn't this more about Tory voters not turning up? Well, there's a lot of different things. Keir Starmer didn't say the words, I'll be Prime Minister, but I think every other pundit... I'm paraphrasing. Every other pundit did, but that's the one sentence you'll, you'll never hear him say. The turnout was very low. That's often the case in by-elections, but as you alluded to, I think it's something like that seat's been Tory for 92 years, yeah, yeah. mid-Bedfordshire. I went there fairly recently, did campaigning, and I've... I've been a candidate and I've uh, campaigned around the country and it, it feels like a Tory seat. It is green, it is leafy, there's a low level of crime. It perhaps what used to be called, and this is not derogatory, is Middle England. Mm. So for that to go Labour is seismic. Uh, but it was on a low turnout, as you say, and it, the result was so good for Labour that it actually causes a bit of a tactical problem because if you say they'd lost narrowly, they'd say, well, we'll carry on modernising, have a few more policies mm. and carry on getting the party in order. But they did so well... What do you do after that? So, so it's really interesting. In, in, in Tamworth, the Labour vote went up by just 700 votes. In mid-beds, it went down. It went down by 200 or, or thereabouts. What's your take on this, Adam? Rishi Sunak, I think, is in serious trouble. Well, I think he's definitely under pressure to a degree with what's happening. Mm. But I think it's far too early to be really calling it. You know, he still is working to his plan, and I think that he's showing good leadership on his plan. He's com committed to it, where Keir Starmer and Labour are flip-flopping a lot. But, but you say that, but Rishi Sunak has got these, mm. I keep saying, five pledges mm. written above mm. his bed, hasn't he? <laughs> Halving inflation, etc. Yeah, yeah. If you go through every single one of his five pledges, he has failed on every single one. 
so far? Well, inflation is coming down. Which Not is thanks a, to him. The ha which is a big part of the plan. Yeah. And I think he's committed. And I think good leadership is being committed, setting the plan, executing the plan, and that is what he's looking Come to do. Come on, there's lots of rumbling, isn't there, behind the scenes, because, of course, the Conservative backbench is deeply worried about losing their seats. Some very high-profile people mm. could go. Do you think... I think he's had... I think he needs time. He's had nine months. He's been committed to what he wants to do. Obviously, this starts to create the pressure um, which has just happened at these by-elections, and without a doubt it does create the pressure, and he could probably do without it, frankly, but he, is, he has had a limited amount of time, a little bit more time, to execute on the plan and see how things come can, and, and we can, can start seeing I can changes. see Muldoon wading in on that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I'm more interested actually in the way people voted in these by-elections because I I'm politically homeless at the moment I really really am and have been for a good long while um, and I wonder if the the Labour um, MP candidate was actually a better person and stood for better things. So, you know, we've always got this thing when we go into general election, do we vote for who we want to be next Prime Minister, therefore you would vote for Conservative, Labour or Lib Dem, Green, whatever. Um, but do you actually vote at a local level? Because your MP, the candidate, might be really awful on lots of things and yet the opposing team... Oh, Team. You I mean, said I've, team. I've said Biden. It. I've said it. I'm not the US president. Um, I wonder if people actually vote locally. Do well, you think that might point. have had an impact? And the really confusing thing, by the way, in America is the colours that are different way around, red and blue yeah, for yeah. the right and left <laughs> parties. But anyway, back to Mid-Bedfordshire. So Alistair Strathan was a former teacher and I think worked at Bank of England as well. So he had a good CV. He lived yeah. in a constituency. But the issue is a by-election is a snapshot or a oh, local a referendum a on the government. Well, it is and it isn't. So you can never extrapolate from a by-election. They have their odd idiosyncrasies and quirks. So it's very difficult to do that. That being said, one thing that is clear about this is the Conservative Party is losing its votes. So, and I would say this, Reform UK picked up a good-sized vote in fact, when you look at uh, mid-beds, Reform UK came third. Yeah. Now, if you add Reform UK's and the Tory vote together, it actually beats Labour. So doesn't that say it's more about... It wasn't positive voting for Labour. Ooh, whoopsie, we want... We See, that's Starmer, my point. That's, that's my point. Well, let me answer that. So I'm afraid <laughs> I think um, Brexit voters should be listened to, but in terms of the general election... I think reform and the Brexit party and all the other incarnations are close to completely irrelevant because they have no MPs, they're in control of zero local authorities and they can't form a government. Um, but you're right. But they're a new party, they're an insurgent party and also aren't people fed up of the two-party two system in Westminster? I think people are fed up of politics full stop and you know there are so many comparisons with the 1990s and Blair which have been a bit overdone but we've got a tired... Well, Starmer himself said he's walking in his footsteps didn't he? Mm. Well I think all leaders of the opposition are to a certain extent when you have someone who's so successful electorally. Remember Labour had never even before Blair had two full terms of Labour government. They tended to collapse. Blair had two full terms mm. and won a third election. So, like it or not, and Keir Starmer seems to have a good relationship with him. And John Smith he is got to Labour elected, really. <coughs> well, John, John Smith would have been a... He, you know, he died he would tragically, have been, would have been a brilliant exactly, Prime Minister. Exactly, exactly. Mm. Let, let, let's, just move, let, let's move on, though, just in terms of what the Conservative Party can do. Do you think it's a slam dunk? Has Labour got this? Uh, no, I think it would depend on the economy, uh, small boats, and whether they can find the, some money down the back of the sofa so, for a so, Okay, so, so what does Starmer want to do with a small boat? Convince me he wants to stop them. Well, I certainly think he wants to stop them because, one, he's a human being, we all are, and we see people are dying in the boats, and whether left or right, I think we'd all agree that that is a tragedy. But Labour have got, um, I think it's a five-point action plan, so, for example, they want to scrap the Rwanda scheme, spend the money on setting up a, a cross-border directorate. They want to What's cut that mean? Um, so they want to woke, work, woke, want to work more closely with France. We've just given them five hundred million quid, and they've done nothing. <laughs> How do you define done nothing? Like the the number of migrants is still co they're still coming across. It has reduced slightly, but we've spent five hundred million quid. Don't we need to turn the boats back? Well, hold on. You say they've done nothing, and then you say the number is coming down, and that's a measure of outputs. That's not a measure of inputs. So, what's your next point then? Well, I can't remember all their five-point plan at this early in the morning, but... That's the issue. The, <laughs> well, to be fair... Because no-one really can remember their plan, and because no, no, their plan changes as I, well, right? No, no, it hasn't changed at all, but elements but of that not the have already been taken. 
No, there it is. So, for just, example, just an cutting the backlog. Yeah, cu- cutting the backlog is sensible because you have people in humane conditions. Yeah, hundred and seventy thousand like, backlog in like Manston. We also know the Home Office is processing applications. People are here at a slower rate than but, ten but years ago. But there's no difference between what you're saying and what the Conservative Party is saying. Do you think Rishi Sunak can get a hold on this? To be fair to the government. They are trying to use Rwanda as a deterrent. It's now at the Supreme Court. We expect a ruling at some point. We've got Manston, we've got Scampton, uh, the baby Stockholm, we've got people going back onto that. They're trying to make it uh, less pleasant for people to come here as a deterrent. Do you think Rishi Sunak can sort this? Yeah, I, I do actually. And I think that exactly what we're saying there is the clarity on the mission. Good leadership is setting the mission, executing on the mission. Time-wise, yes, we've had not a a significant amount of time, but he is getting to the point where he's clear on his intentions. The problem with the Labour Party, in in my perspective right now, is the fact that they're not clear on their intentions and their intentions continue to change as it wins them votes. Mm. So it's like they're playing to the audience rather than actually showing good leadership and executing on what can make the country better. So so it's really interesting. The the, the, the backbenchers are actually the grassroots. Mm. I mean, they didn't vote for Rishi Sunak. Well, they wanted Mm. Liz Truss and Mm. and then the powers that be decided they didn't want Mm. Liz Truss. And actually, some people think that Liz Truss had the right idea. I think her delivery was wrong. Now, what... Going forward, the Institute of Economic Affairs released this yesterday. Public finances are in better shape than expected, leaving room for some well-targeted tax cuts. And and this is going to be crucial for the Conservative Party because Rishi Sunak is now looking at tax cuts. What the Tories need to do is to give red meat to their voters. So Mm -hmm. he's talking about raising the 40p income tax threshold to boost their election prospects. Of course, he is then looking at a number of other things as well cutting stamp duty that would play very well yeah 100 percent. i think that you know if we are in better shape and i think this is the thing about rishi sunak say what you want to say about him it's not like i love him but i you know i, I genuinely think that he makes decisions based off of the numbers and makes decisions based off of, of the correct information and now looking at tax cuts, he's not just looking that wildly. Yes, it's going to help him get votes, but he's looking at that because we're in a better position than expected. I think stamp duty uh, cuts will be very well received because that would uh, certainly allow more people to purchase homes more readily, stimulate the economy, get ourselves into a better situation. Where do you find so, the £10 billion pounds from to pay for it? Well, from he's obviously, and it's the same as any tax cuts that Labour proposed, right? We're going to have to. Well, so so I'll answer that. So the borrowing in the year to date is twenty billion lower than forecast by the OBR. So he has wiggle room if he wanted to do that. Also, the other point I just want to mention here: inheritance tax. It's been talked about for so long. I think it's an iniquitous tax. People have worked all their lives. They've yeah. paid tax. They then have some property or whatever they've got. They get taxed again just because they die. Yeah, I know. So, so would that <laughs> if he if he actually abolished inheritance tax? I think that may well oh, be actually a... be be an absolute slam dunk. It doesn't for the affect Tories. many people though. But it's it around, affects, I can yeah. tell you briefly, it's around 3 to 4% of people that pay inheritance tax. But interestingly, a poll showed the fear of it is much greater. Yeah. Yes. So, for example, so around it, half of society think, as you do, that's bad, that could affect me and my family, that's it, horrible, it it's unfair. But only 3 to 4% of people pay it. So the question is for the government would be, why would they give a tax cut for the richest 3 or 4% of estates in the UK? Survival. Elaborate. So you're saying 50% of people are worried. So I, this is my point. If they actually Perceived said... To be... uh, it, yeah, exactly. If, if they say we're going to abolish inheritance tax, half the electorate will think that is the right and moral thing to do. That gives Rishi Sunak, I think, a huge sway. How are you going to pay for it? I'm not the government. But the question is, is that the right policy, though? Well, policy has to be paid for. You can either raise taxes or cut something else. Well, I'd, I'd cut the state. We've got a bloated state. Too many bureaucrats, too many civil servants. Get rid of all of them. Well, that's a Liz Truss answer. Well, that's because I favour Liz Truss's results. Well, it didn't work out last time. Well, it only didn't work out because the market's bet against her. That's the only reason? Yes. The market's bet against all governments. No, I think she was handled very badly. Chris anyway, I'm not on the end receiving yes, end of this. Um, <laughs> just, yeah. just coming back to you, uh, Adam, just in terms... We've got to go, uh, go I, for I a break I think there now. is a mentality you know for for people when it comes to building creating wealth 
the the mentality is is it, it can switch a lot of people off when you are getting taxed left right and centre and then at the end you get taxed as well you've got that inheritance tax I think if you can remove that tax you're going to create some more aspiration in people to create wealth and that's more activity more economic stimulation um, but I do I do understand that obviously there's a smaller percentage of people be affected by it I think there probably are better tax um, cuts than, than necessarily the inheritance tax for the overall. But I think from a popularity move, I think it would be a very good and popularity move. can I just move. ask you, you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. I don't think we, we look after SMEs enough. This, this would be my actual, you know, my, mm. my, my point is mm. that, you know, um, really looking after small businesses, giving incentives to employ more people, give people more chances, whether that is corporation tax cuts, whether that is incentivising uh, employment. Mm -hmm. Looking after SMEs would be the biggest stimulus. Um, I, I feel for, for the economy and that would help everybody, right? Which Peter, is, yeah. Well, Many in a former life, our small business journalist for the Yorkshire Post, that was, that was quite a long time ago. Many SMEs don't pay corporation tax because that depends on other thresholds. Um, because the they that, stay small, because they've been, you know, they, they don't that, take the risk. That risks. is actually the really yeah. salient point here. They deliberately stay small to stay underneath you, the corporation you, the tax. Of businesses, well, I, I think there are, the different, there are different drivers why, uh, you know, it might be work life balance, you know, say if you're running a bakery. No, it isn't. No, no, it isn't. It isn't. Yeah. It's because you are penalised. Yeah. 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 No, it doesn't work like that. I've run a small no, business so, too. Well, Seriously, I've trained thousands of businesses and the mentality yep. of businesses, oh, I want to stay under the, the VAT rate. Right? Oh, I want to, you know, I don't want to drive that. It is it's totally common. You're not incentivised to grow. And when you do grow, you take a couple of steps back mm -hmm. because you've got to go through these different aspects. So if you incentivise small businesses, you get behind small businesses, that will help everybody. And bring right? cash back yeah. for a starter. And, oh. and stimulate a mentality. You um, well, you could certainly look at... Um, supporting businesses with incentives, yeah, but incentives around you, employment. Could I ask you to name one? No, but do you agree in principle? To supporting small businesses? Yes. Of course so. Everyone in the country would agree with that. Well, would they? Because I think it's politics of envy from the left. No. The point is you believe in a big state, don't you? You want lots of mandarins <laughs> in there, you want high tax. Well, we are taxed to the hilt in this country. The tax burden has risen, but I think that's... It's at the highest it's been for 70 years. Y yeah, you... You're getting a bit overwrought and waving your arm at me. I haven't raised your tax burden. I haven't raised anyone's tax right. burden. Let I me won't. give you one stat briefly. I think it's something like 90% of people working in the private sector work for an SME, not a major corporate like Indeed. Ford or McDonald's. So it's vital to support small businesses. But Labour have talked about Labour have got a whole organisation called uh, Labour for SMEs. Well, that's made me feel a whole lot better. Uh, right, let's take a, take a break, though. <laughs> uh, whilst I'm overwrought and uh, distraught, I'll have to... Um, towel down. Uh, just some breaking news though uh, first aid trucks uh, have now begun crossing into Gaza from Egypt uh, the Rafa border crossing has opened that's good news so the first aid trucks begin crossing into Gaza from Egypt the Rafa border uh, now open. Uh, we'll take a break after the break we'll continue with our head to head I'm toweling down. This is Talk TV
Hello everyone, good morning to you. Welcome back to Talk Today, the time 8.48 now on Saturday, October the 21st. So many messages coming in. We're in the middle of head-to-head, -head, actually. I've got Peter Edwards, former editor of Labour List, and Adam Stott, who's an entrepreneur. Many messages coming in about Rishi Sunak and how he turns this around. Rob Clark in Wiltshire, good morning to you. Rob says, here's a real vote winner. Abolish the insidious IR35. Millions of votes sealed in that. Of course, Rishi Sunak said he was going to abolish it, then he wasn't going to abolish it. It's a really interesting point there. Uh, lots of messages to here. David Sunak says Terry in Birmingham keeps throwing scraps to the voters. Promise to be driver friendly, pushes back next zero but not the end date. The NHS needs root and branch change, civil service too. No, he tinkers around the edges. As for Hunt, he's a right misery. <laughs> And I'm glad you to, said that, not something else. <laughs> the famous oh. Adam Bolton slip of Jeremy Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, very good, yes, indeed. Uh, last act says Gemma, I'm, I'm getting ready for work. I hope work goes well, Gemma. Uh, I'll never be Tory. I'm voting local, which here in Litchfield means I'm voting Lib Dem or Reform if they have a candidate. My the point, Labour Party yeah. is brilliant here, but sadly, taxes say they will never get in for at least about 100 years. Peter Edwards says Sean is a typical lefty Labour wokest talking nonsense in a very smug way. Heaven help us if Drury Starmer and his crew get in. Also, Mick, Mick one for you, Peter. <laughs> I've never heard Peter Edwards ask, how are you going to pay for it on any Labour policy? Listen more frequently. <laughs> All right, OK. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Let's just move on and talk about very serious matters. Really good news, though. The first aid trucks begin crossing into Gaza from Egypt. The Rafa border now open. Just in terms of, of where we are now, Peter, um, very difficult situation, lots of passions here about the UK's role, the US's role here. Israel being advised to urge restraint and caution to be clear on a game plan. And, and people have messaged in saying, well, imagine if the Scottish had invaded and killed people in England, would we show some sort of restraint? The, the impact in the United Kingdom is quite significant. I'm just interested in your thoughts here. Uh, we've now seen an asylum seeker bent on avenging deaths in Gaza, has carried out a suspected terrorist attack here in Britain. He hasn't been named. Many MPs are saying he should be named. We also have heard MI5 considering raising the terrorist threat level in this country to critical, I think, to, um, uh, to, to the, the highest level, uh, which is critical and attack being highly likely in the near future. Also, we talked earlier about the, these, these um, marches, and there's another Palestinian or pro-Palestinian march today, the chanting. What's your view on how much we should know in this country about the level of terror threat and, and the way actually these marches are being conducted. Well, the terror threat is an advisory. The purpose of it is to disclose information to public so they can be uh, aware of risk, especially when going out on things like public transport, which have been targeted before. So that's sensible. But obviously, go going back to what happens next in the region, we've got to keep reminding ourselves this was a murderous anti-Semitic attack, the largest loss of Jewish life since the Holocaust, and we should be horrified at that. Hamas wants to destroy Israel. We also have to keep in our mind, as I'm, I'm sure you do, that civilians are dying in Palestine as we speak. So it's an horrific situation. Um, the world is, in a sense, waiting to see what Israel's next move is. There are troops massing on the border in large number. Israel has said it wants to, to win. But as I understand it, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister, said they, they're not seeking to have an occupation, but they want to, quote-unquote, destroy Hamas. Yes. So I think, uh, and I'm sure governments will, will know much more than we do, but... We need to find out a bit more about what uh, the Israeli definition of success is. Clearly, they're going to go into Gaza. Mm. We don't know for how long, and we, we're obviously very fearful about the, the outcome for civilians, but we, we know that Israel does have a right to defend itself. Uh, and just for you, Adam, looking at the number of asylum applications, we talked about immigration, illegal immigration yeah. into this country. A senior counter-terror official said this is to do with full-scale migration. We have a lot of people coming into this country that don't uh, have our values. They don't share our values. I think it's a problem. Absolutely. Well, I think that obviously the terrible, terrible situation um, with, with everything that's happening and you've got to support um, as, as best as you can. But I think you've got to support there and provide the aid there rather than flooding Britain with more people with different ideas and uh, in, into, into our country for sure. Because you've got to, And also when you're raising uh, terrorist threat levels, that's because 
you know, the people in, in, that are in our country that potentially could undertake those kind of things are going to have very, very different views. And if you just keep flooding in from different places, I think you've got to provide the aid to support people there, and it, it, it seems like that's our intent. But, yeah, I think that it's not about flooding Britain. Oh, but with, with you've people. used the word flooding three times. I've got to mm. challenge you on that. I'm worried that we're conflating aid to the Middle East and a terrorist threat at home and then asylum. Why do you use the word flooding? Well, I feel that, you know, there is a exactly what David just said, that there is a risk um, that we bring lots more people into the country. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, Labour people might want to do is, is continue to, you know, bring more people into the country. And I just think that we've got to, we're providing the support. I think Rishi Sunak's obviously been out there. He's given the intent to give aid. I think we 100% should be giving aid and supporting. But I think you've got to aid people in their own environment. But, but hold on, sorry, the pressure on is. Oh, you, you keep using the phrase flooding and lots well, more. Well, well, well but, it's, yeah. it's, it's point is valid, yeah, isn't yeah. it? The fact is that we have this 170,000 backlog. We aren't processing people enough. There are people who don't share the values that we share in this country. Yeah. I think people are feeling frightened and isolated yeah. in this country. They see a country they no longer recognise and it has to stop. What do you mean, see a country they no longer recognise? Claire, do you want to...? Well, in, in terms of identity, I think this all comes down to identity. Um, so there is... A, and I think we have to sometimes look outside London for this because there's not much diversity of thought, of look, of race, of kin, of, of religion outside London on many of the other larger um, cities in, in, the, in England, at least. Um, but there was only last week a kingpin that was in, in charge of the business model of sending people across the water and yeah. um, uh, for me, it's a business plan. Yeah. For me, it's human trafficking. And that has to stop because no one, no one can um, think that's a good thing at all. And that's what's happening in these boats. I've yet to see women and children coming off the boats. It's mainly men, Albanian men, a lot of them historically as well. And this is not me race baiting. I'm not, what's the word now? You call, you, dog whistling? Dog whistling. I mean, it's just <laughs> and, and the, me the, 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 for situtudes, can we say that? Can I say that? There's actually and the platitudes that are rolled out constantly from the left. You know, you should be more tolerant. You should be better. It's tolerance so, and uh, cancelling that's actually got us where we are. At the and moment. I'm just going to add into that. Let's take, for example, Ipswich, which is near me, where the hotels have been taken over by migrants. The town is unrecognisable. The businesses are collapsing because they don't spend any money in there. People feel alienated in their yes. own communities by what they see as an invasion of foreign people into their homeland. That's what I mean. Well, I definitely wouldn't use the word invasion. Well, I'm using that word. Well, That's what people feel. Well, an invasion is someone coming to get you. But anyway, Just I'll... answer the question. Okay, what I've... would Labour do about this? Because that's what this election will be fought and lost on. But hold on I want to answer some of the previous points because I think Go it's on. important about values. So I've lived in Ipswich. And Have I've, you? I've lived in East London, which is very diverse, uh, people of all colours. And I've also lived in a town like Carlisle, which is a largely white town. People are not anti-immigration per se. They're, Indeed. No. They're worried about overcrowding, public services and integration. Because people can have different values, but I think values, it can become a euphemism for law-abiding and not law-abiding. We have different values in this room, but we all accept the rule of law. But it's things like integration that are concerned. But I worry in some of Adam's comments that we're conflating uh, migration, asylum and the terrorist threat, which is a really confused thing to do. I'm not sure you answered that. Well, no, and I think what, as well. What's the answer, though? So, so just in terms, you mentioned uh, immigration is a great thing, by the way. I think it's a fantastic thing. But you can't have we 10 million it. people coming into this country. We're not. We, but if we look at the population... We haven't got 10 million if, people coming in. We have had 10 million over the last few years. We have no infrastructure. What the what people, the electorate, want is to see a government taking control of the migrant situation. Is Keir Starmer going to do that? I think he would. We've got a points based system now, which is important. The same as Australia. Uh, so you for against that? No, well, no, answer, that's, that's, no, that's, stop asking the questions. Answer the questions. What will Keir Starmer do? What, to reform the asylum system? Yes. We need to process them a lot quicker. Processing's got slower in the Home Office, but the, no one really knows why. He will do what people want to start with, and then he'll change his mind. What would you do? <laughs> well, what would I do? I think we follow the policy that's been set out. And I think that, that Rishi Sunak, at least he has said, this is our plan, he's executing on that plan. And I think this is the whole point, is in terms of the Conservatives, in terms of Labour, you're representing them very well today because you're not making decisions based on it either. You're just asking questions, that's what they do, because they're just flip-flopping, diverting, rather than being direct. 
Well, I'm the only one that's used facts in this discussion. And you say, La- Labour, Yvette Cooper can articulate it very well, has this five point Facts plan. without an outcome, though. Why do you say that? Because no, you're, you're doing it again. You're asking more yeah. and more questions. I'm going to. I mean, I think at the end of the day, in terms of this election, yeah. you have to vote for a party you believe in. You shouldn't vote for the least worst option. Or and they I have think, clear intentions. I think that's that's fair. And Richard, who's just messaged in, has made a really good point. There's a silent army amongst us, housed quietly in hotels, paid for with credit that we will owe. It is time for this country to wake up. I'm going to leave you two with that thought. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Peter Edwards, former editor of The Labour List, and Adam Stott, entrepreneur. That was today's Head to Head. Head to Head. Cool. I think I need that a cup of good. tea well after done. that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I need a cup of tea right. <laughs> after that. They're, they're, just, uh, they're just rioting gently in the corner. Um, right, keep all of your messages uh, coming in, please. Um, Peter doesn't say how any Labour policy will be funded because he knows the party have already spent the full unknown amount they expect to get from scrapping non-DOM status. It's been used to pay for everything so far, apparently. Let's remember, the money they think they'll get is based on today's non-DOMs. They will disappear. They will fall dramatically as and when they leave the system and when Labour get into number 10. Keep all of those coming in please. This is Talk TV broadcasting live from London. This is Talk TV. Three, two, one. Uh, go Browns. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. Me and you, conquer time. Who that wins? Happens. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> <laughs> uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted new. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of (laughs) Can you please reinstate my account? Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. (gasps) So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. The one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus. Boris Johnson uh, isn't what he was. Most of them seem to have given up. Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, Mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem solved. Yeah. Problem solved. He's as fit as a butcher's dog. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. (laughs) But but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. The knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, I know, you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying this girl. I can't say, I'm not, I'm not a Swifty. Critics, I'd say me included, <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. You're going to to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. It was a fabulous dinner until (laughs) you two uh, mooned us. (laughs) Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place uh, where you get the truth.
Join me every day from Monday to Friday, 3 p.m. until 5 p.m. for news, views and a mega dose of attitude. Tune in if you dare. Hello, very good morning to you. It's just after nine o'clock now on Saturday, October the 21st. This is Talk Today. I'm David Bull. Thank you very much indeed for your company. I hope the weather's all right where you are. We're going to be talking more about the flooding later in the show. I've been hit by the flooding. I know, obviously, the weather alerts are up there. They're very severe indeed in Scotland, so please be careful. Uh, great news, though, for you this morning because it's International Day of the Nacho. Yeah, it's also, and I love this film, it's Back to the Future Day. Yes, and the reason for that is, if you remember, in the Back to the Future films, which I am a complete anorak and love those films, today was the date that was set on the computer. Well, it was actually the 21st of October, and it was 2015, if you remember, with Martin McFly and Doc and the DeLorean and all the rest of it. Also, <laughs> thank you very much. Also, uh, other great news, the Supreme Cat Show is on in Warwickshire. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Right, let's move on to our fascinating facts. Today's fascinating <laughs> facts. <laughs> well, Mrs. Tootfair and Claire Muldoon is in the house uh, this morning. With no haggis neeps or needs or tatties either, and no square slice so, sausage. So let me tell you that I uh, I never liked haggis, and I went to a restaurant and had haggis neeps, mm. which are turnips, mm, aren't they, mm -hmm. and tatties, mm -hmm. and then you pour whiskey, whiskey on it. Whiskey cream sauce. It's delicious. It is, it is, it is. Tell you what we'll do, we'll have a burn supper at your house. Yeah. Let's do that and let's do the who's, breakfast show from there. Who's cooking? Renny, I'll cook. Okay, great. I'm fantastic. We can cook. do the breakfast show from there. Yes. Uh, we'll get the crew down. Yes. Yeah, we'll have a whole... Because uh, you've got space. Yeah, yeah. And you've got an arga. I have an arga, yeah. Uh, well, if it's not uh, flooded, but we'll talk about that. We're not allowed to use that word. Peter said we've not to use flooded, remember? Right. Yes, that's, <laughs> that, that's very true indeed. Right, so some, so on this day, yeah. we, we're talking about, what happened on this day? Do you remember any of them? Uh, Nelson. Yeah, good. Um, so he died. Well, yeah. Dunlop. Now, the reason Dunlop... So hang on a minute. So 1805, just for people who've woken okay. up, at the Battle of Trafalgar, Nelson gave that famous signal, England expects. Uh, we won, the British won against Napoleon. Nelson was killed. In the victory, yep. Nelson's flagship is preserved in Portsmouth. Yep. Next one. Um, chap called Dunlop, who was in the, the army. Dunlop, so Ernest Dunlop Swinton, he was uh, the inventor of what? Now, I I only heard Dunlop in that and I automatically thought of tyres or no. something, right? And he, what it wasn't. Think of something else that moves you forward. Would that help? Moves you forward? No, it wouldn't help. No, it wouldn't help. No. Give me another clue. The tank. Oh, the tank. English tank, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, on this day in 1958, what was the next one? I don't know. Female peers, peers in the House right. of Lords. Peers, that's right, that's right. Someone actually on Twitter said Lady Claire, and I said that's got a nice ring to I it. I think Baroness Muldoon. Baroness Muldoon. <laughs> that gives you... Of Chiswick. Yes, oh, you would, you'd be so august, wouldn't you? Lording it up. <laughs> indeed, and you'd do that very well indeed. <laughs> and then, as I was saying, in 1997 on this day as well, Candle in the Wind became the biggest selling single in music history. That rewrite for Princess Diana, yep. of course. Yep. Um, an amazing piece of music. Music. Well done. Those Thank were today's you. fascinating facts. Right. Uh, this morning I've been asking about uh, Rishi Sunak. Three by-election losses. Lots of you saying, well, the Conservative Party needs to be Conservative, not mm. actually voting for Labour. When you actually dissect those those results, yes, they were very big swings to Labour. That's what John Curtis was saying to me, I think it was only yesterday on Talk Today, uh, that they were very big swings indeed. Now, the question is, did people proactively vote for Labour? I don't think they did. I think it was more about the Conservative Party staying at home or switching allegiances to other parties. So then the question for Rishi Sunak, and we were talking mm. earlier on about inheritance tax being mooted, tax cuts, uh, also uh, stamp duty uh, to try and woo the voters. Now, just in terms of the timing, when should Rishi Sunak call an election? Would you do it now and surprise everyone, including yourself probably? Uh, would you do it later this year? Would you do it in the spring? Would you do it in the summer? Hang on till the very last end. Let's talk to Carmel now in Swindon. Good morning. 
Good morning, David. Hi there. So, what are your thoughts? I'm actually watching you on TV. I thought I was on TV, but I, I'm obviously on the radio. I'm not sure which one, uh, <laughs> which one I'm supposed to be on, but there you go. Right, well, we, we're on everywhere. So, t radio, TV, on your smart speaker, we're everywhere. But really good to talk to you. What's, what's, what are your thoughts this morning? Well, to, to be honest, I think we should have called a general election, I think, within the first two months of... Uh, the disastrous um, choices that this Prime Minister makes. I mean, I love Rishi. I think he's a very polite, lovely, lovely guy. Um, but he really doesn't have that grit and, if I dare say it, balls to run the country. Mm. You know, the, the state of, you know, I mean, I was just talking to you, to your researcher about uh, uh, not, I'm not going to divert straight onto the Palestinian and, and all the marches in Swindon, uh, sorry, in London, rather. Um, but, you know, uh, I pay my taxes, I work, like everybody yeah. else. We don't want this war being brought over to um, to, uh, to, to to England. We really don't. Um, you know, I'm sat here quite worried. with, And I sympathise with what's going on on both sides in Israel. Of course. But here we are, sat here, and I'm probably talking for mass millions in this country. But we don't, you know, if you want to protest about a war, I mean, this, not about doctors going on strike that's different or anything of our homeland issues that's different when it's outside of our country you should go over to your own countries and uh, and and um you know protest there and sort it there and then come back when you've done your protest it should be absolutely zero tolerance to allow people to bring a war onto the streets of london because now we're sat here on extremely high alert for terrorism, which we are normally on alerts anyway. But we are. I, I just, I, I feel actually unsafe with this going but on. But you see, that was the point... coming to England. <laughs> Excuse me, that was the point I was trying to make to Peter, was that people like you, Carmel, feel very much that you don't recognise the country we're in, that you feel scared to be in your own country. Well, yeah, I mean, I went to London my summers at university, and... You know, I mean, and I don't mean this disrespect because, you know, I, I, there's a lot of decent ethnic minority people in this country. Of course. Very decent. But also, we, you know, I went down tooting and I couldn't see anyone. I was quite intimidated. I was the only one. But wasn't person. that because it was out, out of your normal experience? What I'm talking about really yeah. here is, yeah. is political doctrine, religious ideology, yeah. not fitting yeah, with this country. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we, you know, you see them on the streets uh, parading their their hatred. I mean, and we stand and video it. I mean, that is incitement to war in in in, in any aspect of war. You don't just come over on a plane to kill us, you know, and, and shoot down uh, from the skies. You know, war is inciting hatred on the streets, which then causes knives and guns to be shot, and before you know it. Uh, we'll all be uh, wrapped up in the Israeli-Palestinian war, which I, we don't want here. I, thi I think, to be honest, here. Carmel, you make some very strong points. Mm -hmm. I think we're already wrapped up in it, uh, to be honest. Um, le let's move on now, though, if we may, and talk about the storm's really devastating pictures coming in. The second red danger to life weather alert in a week has now taken effect in eastern parts of Scotland. Torrential rain, high winds forecast across the UK. Now, forecasters are saying that actually 70 to 100 millimetres of rain could fall today in parts of Angus and Aberdeenshire already mm. hit by severe flooding. Very sadly, of course, three people have died since Thursday when Storm Babette first took hold. Uh, well, joining us now is Derry Aldrich, who's live news editor of the Press and Journal in Aberdeenshire. Uh, Very good morning to you. Good morning, David. J just talk us through the latest there in Scotland, this, this red weather alert. Um, th these are pretty horrific scenes uh, we had nick ellaby up there yesterday uh, just tell us through tell, talk us through the latest okay so yeah it's, it's been it's been pretty grim in this part of the world over the past few days we've had everything from flooding to power cuts uh, traffic chaos roads have been closed and uh, the waves here in stonehaven i'm uh, nine, uh, 50 miles from aberdeen and the waves are crashing far beyond their, their usual boundaries over the harbour walls. 
Yeah. And just uh, just in terms, I mean, clearly three people died, including a man in his 60s, caught in a fast-flowing flood water in the town of Cleobury. A mortimer in Shropshire, we've got a 56-year-old man dying after his van hit a tree near Forfar, and a 67-year-old woman was being killed after being swept into the water of Lee. Is there any... I'm, I'm going to talk about... Um, I, I've, I've been flooded as well in East Anglia, but in, in, in terms... I mean, clearly this is very serious with potential loss of life. What are people being told to do? Uh, so people have been told to, to not travel in, in the red risk areas. Um, a lot of the Aberdeenshire and uh, north of that is amber as well. That's an amber alert, and that's not something we take lightly either. So the advice really is to stay at home and, and stay safe. And are people abiding by that? Um, so travel's been massively disrupted here. Um, we've actually got families staying with us because they can't get home to Ayrshire at the moment. Uh, the main roads south from Aberdeen have been closed for two days now. Gosh. And all the trains have been cancelled. So people don't really have a choice. A lot of the roads are closed and the ones that are open are, are, are just not safe. And what about trying to get supplies in food, for example? Um, so we are seeing uh, supplies in supermarkets uh, beginning to fall because we can't get uh, um, traffic up the road to get food here. Um, we see some, uh, some empty shelves and, yeah, it's all pretty grim. Right. What's, what, what, Claire. I, I just wonder what the devolved regional councillor, I, a.k.a. Hamza Youssef, is doing about it. What, what, what's the position of the Scottish Government? Uh, what are they doing in terms of helping um, Scotland um, weather the storm, which certainly is not a Babette's feast? Um, to, to, to be honest, uh, we're just hearing advice to, to, to stay in. And around 25 miles from me in Brecon, we've had uh, severe flooding. Mm. Hundreds of people have been uh, forced to evacuate from the town and their homes and um, they are being helped but they're, they're told they might not get back into their homes until Christmas or beyond that. Golly. God, that, I mean, that must be absolutely devastating. Thank you so much, Derry. That's Derry Aldrich there, live news editor of the Press and Journal in Aberdeenshire. Um, well, I found out I've also been flooded as well, Claire. I've got some pictures, actually. So East Anglia has been hit really hard as well. Uh, this is my, very near me, this is Framlingham, which uh, made famous by Ed Sheeran. Look at that underwater mm. as a result of what is going on. Um, and and this this rain, I was talking to my family, they said they've never seen rain like it. I mean, it was, it was just monsoons. That's the car park. Mm -mm. Look at that. Goodness me. So people left their cars there. Uh, expecting to return and that just shows the deluge of water that fell just so quickly again that's in Framlingham in Suffolk that's a field <laughs> allegedly Th this is I've seen this before in Suffolk but mm. never quite mm. like this we're used to getting flooding but not quite like this and then I think the final picture which we're going to show you in just a moment is actually in my house uh, yeah, that's mine. Look at that. Uh, that's mine. Uh, flooding right up. So I've got some uh, sort of farm buildings and that is uh, trying to walk down the road. I mean, it's just absolutely well, you impossible. You need to get that cleared for the burn supper, won't you? Well, I will. The, the sun, the sun I, also has I been I will great. indeed. <laughs> and, and look, here we go, ju just more. So devastating pictures, yeah. actually. And the thing about a flood, and this is what I think is just so difficult, it's, it's not really the initial insult. It's no. the rest. It's the cleaning. And remember, this stuff has come off the field. So what we're seeing is the waterlogged fields, mm. this torrent of water coming off the fields. Which, water is very, very powerful. It's, it's strong mm. in movement. And, of course, then it will take all the, the, the top off the, the fields and be extremely mucky. So really important thing, point there you brought up about the fact it, it will be horrendous the aftermath in terms of cleaning up this. I mean, the Sun have got great uh, visuals here in Nottinghamshire. The, I mean, it looks like a, an underground water car park. Uh, Lighthouse hit Cheshire, Wimbledon even. Uh, Cambridgeshire, Leeds Bradford Airport, where you mentioned mm. earlier, with the 2E flight skidded off the, rain, the, yeah. the, the runway and wasn't even able to take off. And Tom, your sports chap, mentioned that Leeds United couldn't fly to Norwich to play their game. Mm. Well, last night, my brother actually hosted three families who were stranded, couldn't oh. get back. Also, I have to 
to do a big shout out as well to my sister who's been absolutely incredible so my sister went round to mine and she's managed to remove 140 litres of wow. water out of my house oh no yeah so I'm thrilled about that so thank you very much Katie um, I, I owe how you how could she measure that though well, she, so she's got she a submersible a job, she? Yeah, no she's got a, a proper water hoover because <laughs> we're used to getting these things but anyway thank you very much indeed uh, for doing that keep all of uh, your messages coming in the, these are interesting actually David what's this flooding down to is it lack of maintenance too many building developments I'll tell you one of the things that's really interesting about mm. this is just in terms of the builders building on floodplains they're floodplains for a, a reason. reason they flood exactly I do wonder whether there is actually any joined up thinking uh, at all. Of course there's not. <laughs> of course, of course Planet not. Planet are we living on? Well, let's go to Norwich. I said uh, I said Norwich has been hit very well. Norfolk's been hit very yeah. hard as well. I don't think we're talking about that. Barry, good morning. Good morning. I'm not floating down the streets of Norwich. What's it been uh, like in Norwich? Uh, not too bad. Quite heavy rain yesterday, but not very much flooding in the city centre. A lot of it was on the outskirts of the bypass, southern bypass, mm. A11, eastern. I mean, right, but in the city, it was uh, all right. But I was going to take, I was nearly taken off with that guy. What's his name, Peter? Peter, yes, yes from Labour List. Hey, what the? I'd love to take him out with me for a day. <laughs> yeah, right. When I, when I do it for work in the mornings, right, yeah, I see people who were born in this country who have fought for this country and shopped always and you've got people coming over here illegally getting put in barges moaning about it it's, and hotels yeah right and he caught uh, oh honestly people like him make you really angry that's why the labor party please god do not let them get near down in the street well he kept yeah. saying well I, I mean he kept asking me the questions and i was oh, trying i was trying to say to him look and he was trying i trying to say well you know how do people feel about this but the point is and that's why i used ipswich as an example mm -hmm. we've got pretty much all the hotels taken over with migrants who haven't been processed am i right in saying people don't recognize the country they live in anymore i've lived in norwich all my life right yeah and the area where i live in all you've got is barber shops, yeah. tandoori shops, bookies, and second-hand shops, right? Yeah. But that you know, also, I could throw back at you, isn't that the... That's on, the death the, of the high street, well, the I would say, Barry. the high street, the rise of online shopping, yeah. we're all really lazy. Yeah. But I think what he needs to do, Peter, as I said, this his name, Tony Blair is to blame for this, for opening up them borders in 2004. That's where it all started off, Mr Blair. And he is responsible for all this when he opened up the borders to Europe and yeah, everything else. Yeah, and it's the Labour Party who's to blame for this. And Starmer didn't even mention immigration once in his speech. No, yeah, it's a very good point. Yeah. He didn't. Uh, and, and I find that absolutely amazing because the cost of living and immigration are probably the, the, the two biggest points in this country. So can I just ask moment. you, so just in terms of the election result, do you think the Conservatives sat on their hands and thought, look, we don't have a Conservative government, but they didn't want to vote Labour? What does that do for the Tories? What would they have to do to get your vote? Oh, God almighty. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I mean, the turnout of them, both of them by elections, were, was really, really low, wasn't it? Yeah, it start? was. Uh, 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 and, you know, I, I, I just think I won't be voting Conservative or Labour. I'll be voting for a party that you know quite well. Right. Uh, uh, but... Uh, yeah, I, I just think generally the country had enough of the Conservative Party, but it's just like, you know, like in America, you know, the choice they've got in America, the choice got, the, the, we need a Prime Minister who's going to stand up for the country, stand up for the values of the country. Barry, I think you're up. completely right. We need a statesman, we need a leader, and within great leadership it has to show certain qualities. I don't think anyone has that at the moment in Westminster at all. Um, David not. asked the question this morning to you all, when do you think Rishi Sunak should call a general election? The next millennium. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> it can't, it can't wait that long. <laughs> no, uh, I think probably if he's got the country at heart, like he says he has, I think you should call it reasonably quickly. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's fascinating. Really fascinating, Barry. Thanks, Thank Barry. you very much indeed. Have we got time for one more? Oh, we should have. Come on. Uh, I'll do it after the break, actually. Let's take a you break. Tease. And then I'm going to. I know. You tease. And then we'll talk to Chris after the break. This is Talk TV. <laughs>
Welcome back to Talk Today with me, David Bull. Um, I've got the Muldoon in. You have. <laughs> Get off your... Oh, no, you are on the phone. That's Hashtag fine. breakfast uh, doctors. Yeah, yeah, very That's good. That's what in. I'm on. Oh, well done. Well instructed. I, I thought Get that whip away. I thought away. you were doing your shopping. Get that whip away. <laughs> well, quite. Um, I must Steve's say, doing that. So some nice <laughs> messages, by the way. We'll come on to him in a minute. Um, uh, some, uh, some messages. Can, what, will you two stop it? <laughs> um, Trish uh, says, I must say, I do appreciate this lovely, very common sense Scottish lady on the oh, screen. Oh, thank you. What me. a pleasure after some of... <laughs> can I read the rest of that out? <laughs> I don't know if I can. What, what, uh, what after after some of the others, Dr Rennie is not going to be happy with that. Well, she's not one of the others. We can't other Dr. <laughs> Rennie. Well, I'm that. only here because of her. That is also that's true. All, that's By the way, true. I'm talking about flooding and I was saying about my yeah. house and everything. This is cheery, isn't it? Uh, Chris Lord in Manchester says, David, as a doctor, you've probably heard about mould toxicity. Hearing your flooding mould grows in 48 hours. Mycotoxins proliferate. Uh, it's really bad. Oh. Um, the, <laughs> you're going to end up with health issues. Uh, thanks for that. That's really made my day. I've already already had a, a nightmare with that, but well done, my sister, and well done, Katie. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, lots of other messages about the elections. Um, Edward Heath called an election over who should run the country. He lost. Is Sunat likely to call one tomorrow? Really big gamble if he does. Mm. That's Michael in the Isle of Thanet. Uh, also, yes, I forgot our other caller, Chris, is in Surrey. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Great show. Thank you very much yeah. indeed. So oh, what you're you... doing a fantastic, a fantastic job, but I do miss my dose of Renault in the morning. Oh well, we well we all do. It's very quiet in here without Renault. Yeah. <laughs> right, I've, I've, I've fair Just as well, I can hear I'll it. Be, I'll try and be concise. Sure. First of all, I need to remind you of a few years ago of the illegal immigrant that was found working as a security guard in the MOD. Yes, I remember. That was about, that was about five, six years ago. Um, now, at that time, we had one million estimated illegal immigrants or overstayers, people that shouldn't be here, mm. had no right to be here. We've now got 175,000 waiting to be processed. Yep. Now, the reason they're waiting to be processed, David, <clears throat> is that they're destroying all their paperwork before they get here. I know. So, at the Home Office, you know, I, I, and I've got no truck with the Home the home office because I've had my own problems with them uh, and I'll qualify myself as my girlfriend is a Muslim. So oh we've spoken I, before haven't we yeah. Yeah yeah um, I'm still having that fight to trying to get her a tourist visa right. just to come and visit. Um, the, 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 the the guy that is in the, the Claire I think Claire was mentioning him earlier uh, just got 11 years in Belgium came here in 2020 is an Iranian refugee mm. and was granted status. Turns out he was from Iraq and turns out he was the kingpin in at least 10,000 people coming across on the boat. That's, that's right, he was. Now, if you go back to what I was saying about the Home Office, I mean, they have got a God almighty job because most of these people are claiming to have come from failed states. Mm. So how the hell do they quantify that they actually come from there or that they've got a criminal record. Well, anything at all. well, well, you know, you're right. Also, I think I think what people are very worried about is the threshold of allowing people permanent leave to remain in this country. It's it's far too low, I think. Mm -hmm. And many other European countries, it's much higher. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think it's a, re a real problem. Chris, thank you very much indeed for your yep. call. I mean, it is, isn't it? Well, that it is. But then you say that. But look at look what's happening in Lampedusa in in Italy. Yeah, the, ten thousand. The, yeah, I mean nothing. Can can stop that point system can't stop because it so, is massive massive um, immigration. It is. I mean, we are we we're we're at a lower number in this country than last year. Yeah. Last year was forty four thousand. Yeah. When you look at Italy, one hundred and seventy thousand. And we need to look at as well. I'm sorry, but you know, this the language, the emotive language. All oh, refugees, this uh, women and children. Refu to be a refugee, you need to be fleeing from a war torn country. There's not a lot of war-torn countries. Not an countries, economic migrant. Not an migrant. economic migrant. Yeah, yeah well said. You know, I mean, we need to stop with the emotions of this when we yeah. speak about it. We need to remove it. We need to look at it tactically. We need to look at it with a fresh pair of eyes and we need to stop the process. Border Force will tell you if um, someone presents at the airport without the correct paperwork, all they need to say is, 
I'm an asylum, I'm seeking asylum. I know. And that is the rule that, that starts the whole clock I mean, ticking. But and of the course, we, we've passed the illegal orbit. migration bill. The government has talked tough on that. That was very tough to get that through the, the, the houses. Um, but, but it has gone through. Of course, if you come here illegally, you will be removed. You will stay for 28 days and be yeah. removed. You cannot claim asylum, etc., yeah. etc. It hasn't been implemented in. No, it hasn't it's not. worked. It's not. And they need to sort it out. Claire, they do. thank you uh, very much indeed for the moment. Time for a gear change. It's time for <laughs> Denya's Delights. <laughs> Denya's Delights. <laughs> Talking of an old gearbox. There that's we the, are. <laughs> that's the face of a Saturday morning right there. Good morning, yeah. everyone. Good you're, morning. How are you guys? Well, you're in my bad books, but anyway, Can fine. I start by saying that is my favourite shirt you've ever worn? Really? It's that's a right. work of art. <laughs> I don't know one. where to go. I'm with just this. trying it's to really be up actually. because of the Madonna week. Oh, I so, see. Uh, yes. When are we? Are we talking about that later or now? No. I, so I bought a present back from Madonna oh, you? for you. Seeing as you didn't go, did you hear what happened? Sorry. Stop. Okay. I didn't go because you didn't invite me. Claire, he's such a difficult person <laughs> to pin down. I thought you were going to say something else there. I would have. Uh, I would have bought the tickets. He wouldn't have come. He does ten thousand shows a week. But how do you uh, get so the tickets? Difficult. Well, though? so I was uh, Chris Evans, Madonna reporter this week. Right. So Chris ended up sending me because he said you can't be the madonna reporter unless you've been to every single gig <gasps> so bless him he sent me to the o2 to cover it and i've been on the chris wow. Evans breakfast show on virgin radio i've got a clip this is the moment on saturday night we spoke about this exactly a week ago we didn't know how madonna was going to look what the show was going to be like this is the moment the queen arrived let's take a look nice. look at this <laughs> So that started the greatest hit show. She's back in December, by the way. So, so right. So, but w this was that the night she overran. No, so this was the night. There's been a few problems, Claire. Bear with me. This is like a soap opera. The first evening, the sound went. So she's on, yeah. she's song number three, and it's kind of, it's going... And she starts singing the wrong words to the the part of the song. She's kind of, she can't hear herself. Oh, right. So they had to, you know, we spoke, there's no band. It's all kind of computerized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had to reset the show. So she's marooned on stage yeah. for 15 minutes. Did she chat? Yes. What's she said, look, chat like? Well, so she said, look, I'm going to start at the beginning i arrived in new york city yeah. 35 dollars yeah and this oh, happened, right. and, that oh, happened and i met this person and then she ran out of the story and then she's like so she then starts talking to the crowd and talking about what they're wearing <laughs> she then says can someone help me we're now 10 minutes yeah. and the audience is starting to talk and it was very uncomfortable but you've never seen her like that it's an incredible show and, and so just in terms of this uh, an extraordinary show by the look of it yeah and, uh, i heard from various people that she didn't seem in the best of health. Is that fair? She's got a leg problem. She's got a leg kind of um, like brace she's on, basically. 65. She's sixty-five. I mean, she's but young. She looks incredible. Well, it is I mean, young. To, but to do no, that, it's a not. two and a half hour I mean, show, you know. And they're still dancing in it. She, um, I thought by Sunday evening, because I went to all four. Uh, by <laughs> Sunday, how many, evening, how many did you go to? Four. Um, <laughs> she, all of them, Steve. <laughs> yes. You want to leave now? I'm 100 percent the dollar guys. I think I've peaked. I don't think I need to do any of the rest of the report. Um, on Sunday night, she had fun and she looked like she had it. So she um, relaxed. Into however, it then. on Wednesday night, she yeah. didn't get on stage till 9:40. So, I mean, she was an hour and a bit late. But then so, there were these huge financial penalties, weren't they, if she's not yes. out by a certain so time? So apparently Sunday evening she went over the O2 curfew, and, and I'm, I'm hearing she's been billed £300,000. Yeah. It's a bit like me losing a fiver, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it is. So really. I'm sure she can afford and, it. And just, just in terms of, was it worth the wait in terms of the staging? Just the most incredible show. It's the closest to Blonde Ambition, a show that I know that you love. There's I one did. lovely I went moment it. where the bed comes up out of stage. From from the blonde admission tour, and it really is. It's it's kind of peppered with great moments from the concert tours, from the interviews. She's such an agent provocateur, though, isn't mm, she? Yeah. I mean, she does. I mean, everyone lambasted. The interesting thing for me is everyone lambasted Sam Smith yes. when he, they went on stage and um, 
was very provocative in in the, the use of the dancers for the production. Yes. But so was Madonna, and but no one seems had to a, be mentioning no, but that. She, but remember, she had at the topless time, girls on, the, on, on stage. Well, she does the, on this on, on That's this what show. I'm saying, that's so she, really interesting. And no one's mentioning it. Is if this show had been in 1990, it would have been cancelled first night. We've come on so far well, that you she say can't that. Well, well, I was about to say, have we come have on, we, on, or have we have just we really? lost any moral compass? Mm. I'm just well, throwing that out. this is a whole different debate for another Daniel's Dylan. I think, but um, 10 out of 10. Daniel's just delight. <laughs> Undelight. It was just wonderful. Just Good. wonderful. Oh, can really we go pleased. in December? You, well, if you invite All me. All right, then. Um, if Chris Evans you... gives you the tickets. Yes, exactly. I'm not paying. VIP. <laughs> tell Chris Evans. Got a we, were box. In the pit. we were in the pit. C tell Chris Evans to give us the tickets. Okay. We'll go. I'll, I'll get back to you with his response. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know what the response is. <laughs> no. Um, uh, this is a Sun exclusive today. Yes. Can we just play? I just want to play you. You may remember this. Our late queen and that Paddington Aww. sketch. Take a little look at this, it's a delight. Thank you for having me. I do hope you're having a lovely jubilee. Tea? Oh, yes, please. <gasps> <laughs> I mean, I, it's just perfect. Isn't it? Everything about that is Wasn't perfect. It? And, um... I, she, I, I was very fortunate. I did meet the late Queen, and and she she was extremely game. I think yes. She she, she spent time with people. She was very considered mm. in her response to people, and obviously she probably wanted to nail the part. Well, it, exactly that. So Simon Farnaby, who's the guy who played the butler in that clip, uh, he's spoken to the Sun. The Sun have got an exclusive today about what she was like, and mm. apparently she was an utter delight. She didn't leave that table until she got it absolutely perfect. And he said to her. Mom, you're quite the actress. And she said, I've been acting my whole life. One Aww. one tends to have to in this <laughs> role. And uh, it's a beautiful story. That That's the moment of the Jubilee mm. that we all remember mm. that went around the world. Mm. People loved it. Of course. And they loved her. And wasn't there an issue with she was she couldn't quite master getting a marmalade sandwich out of her handbag? It kept getting trapped, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> marmalade everywhere. But so beautiful, so funny, and so unexpected. Yes. Wasn't it? It's just perfect. Perfect. Yes, it reminds Perfect. me actually that w when we do those things, we do them so brilliantly. It reminds me of the Olympics, 2012 mm. Olympics, when we had bomb, didn't we? And yep. flying, flying into the yes, arena exactly and all the rest that. of it. Um, but, but amazing, really, really Danny brilliant. Danny Boyle did a fantastic job. He, oh, did. he really, oh, really he did. Ceremony. Oh, it was there, Steve. incredible. Were you there? there? Yeah. Oh, for Were goodness you there? sake. I, I watched it on telly, but it was just amazing. <laughs> um, right, amazing. now, um, somewhere that I do like to go to occasionally, although it is actually Disneyland for, for adults, Vegas. Yes. What's going on in Vegas? Vegas, so if you fancy Adele... No, I don't. Right, OK. Every well. song sounds the same. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, she's amazing. I'd, I'd love to see this. The only uh, problem is, well, she's extended the Vegas run, so it was supposed to end next month. It's restarting in January. This is now the third leg, if you like, right. of the show. Um, she could overtake Celine Dion if she does another leg after this leg. But the trouble <laughs> is, and I've just Googled this, the average price of a ticket is £3,000. What? So it's Seriously? very, very expensive. Yeah. What? But it's quite a thing. Like, she talks to the audience. Lots of people have started proposing. She comes out into the audience, and apparently it's a brilliant... So it's, it's more like an audience with... It's a massive um, show, but very intimate But you see, well. I can't justify, even if I had that kind of money, I couldn't justify three grand for, uh, for a night out. I'm yeah. sorry, that's just too much, And all much, the songs sound the same. They I'm do. kind of with, uh, I'm yeah. with Claire on yeah. that. Well, Tell me, Steve, what's, yes. what's the rumour surrounding um, Madonna headlining Glastonbury? Well, so Emily Evis, we saw her on Saturday night at the O2. Was that day four or day three? That was of day day one. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to remember. Um, and then the following oh, so day, gauche. in the sun, 
they're saying that there are advanced talks. Oh. I could see it happening. I mean, what a moment. Madonna has never, this is the other thing about Madonna, she's never done a greatest hit show. Mm. She's always been forward facing. It's just like, no, yeah. I'm yeah. not a legacy artist. It's about the new stuff. So this is the only time she's done it. Probably the only time she will ever do it. Yeah. So why not do Glastonbury? So, well, I was going to say, what about Madonna doing a residency in Vegas? In Vegas. Well, that would make sense with their help. It would make enormous sense. We, know, we would go over to I, see her. Do you know what? I'll just we'll take we... away all my last comments <laughs> and I would and go, go to Madonna. <laughs> yeah. Uh, OK, let's uh, let's move on if we can, because today is Back to the Future Day. It is. Tell me about So you had a fascinating fact on I the top did. of the so hour. October it's not the that fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Have you finished? Uh, I love oh, it's just I love nine minutes. <laughs> Uh, so, October the 21st, 1995, is the date they set in the DeLorean to go back. To go back, yes. Yeah. You so, do realise, if it was out now, we would go back to 1993. So, if it was oh, set really? now... So, you'd go back to Mr Blobby, uh, I wouldn't Too Unlimited... Mind, I wouldn't mind going back to 1993, actually. The 90s really? were great. Pint of beer, 89p. Great music. You could go out on a Friday night with £20 and still have shrapnel left on a Sunday evening. I, I mean, I what remember. a time And we had life. TGI Friday at th um, TF <laughs> TFI. 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 No, TFI. Not, not the restaurant, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was TFI remember. Friday with Chris Evans, just yes. Christoph Lamy Pies. Is this is also... <laughs> I love this as well. But quickly, just because you mentioned Back to the Future, Back to a the quickie. Future musical is the best thing you will ever see really? on stage. So, the car is a side. You do realise, before they decided on the DeLorean being a time machine, uh -huh. they were going to use a refrigerator. And it was a last-minute decision to actually use a car. And I don't want to spoil it, but at the end, the car gets a standing ovation. At the end oh, don't say any more. It's just so, Everyone should go and see it. So the Adelphi Theatre in London, you can get a ticket for about 40 quid if you book in advance. Wow. And it's um, the best thing I've ever seen. So, so we are watching pictures uh, on screen now, but um, I was speaking to another producer, Gabriella, and she was saying that it is just beyond spectacular. Oh, and, amazing. Um, I really want to see that. But, well, we but I, I, was, I wasn't sure whether it would translate for the stage. It's like some of the songs were a little bit, how can I say, a bit tenuous. Yeah. Because, you know, but it does feature the Huey, you know, yeah. Lewis and yeah, the yeah, new yeah, song yeah. and the car. Back in time. There, there is a scene, and I'm like, it, I was absolutely uh, speechless at how good it was. I was what? like, how did they do it? 21 gigawatts. What? It's a great film, yeah, no, it's a brilliant film. It's an absolute. On a day like today, I'd like to say and watch them all. Well, yeah. I actually did that with um, one of my with my ne one of my nephews and two nieces, and I sat them down and made them watch Back to the and Future. Did they love it? They loved it. Oh, yeah. um, and it was really it's brilliant magical, for me to relive it yeah. because I haven't seen it for many many years. Michael obviously. J. Fox is amazing. Isn't, isn't he? Yeah, he? Isn't he? Really it was is. just perfect. Yeah, wasn't it? made Apparently, for their own. Before Michael J. Fox, they they were going to cast Johnny Depp. So it could have been completely really? different. What a different take that would have been. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Right, in terms of gigs tonight, yes. what's going on? S Club, my old friends. Really? Yeah. They're not okay, so really, you go back, they? do you? We, we do indeed, Amazing. but I'll tell you about that. Well, well apparently this, this gig... <laughs> Is um, there's so much banter going on in here? I can't catch up. Um, it, it's amazing. Obviously, Paul passed away earlier yeah. on in the year. Hannah's not in the band, so they're now called S Club. There's five of them. Right. Um, back to Madonna. So Madonna was re rehearsing in the Manchester Arena, and S Club couldn't get in to do their first date. Right. So it was all kind of rushed. Um, it's a really simple show. There's literally a staircase and a door, and they come on in loads of sparkly, glittery, you know, outfits, <laughs> and they do their back catalogue. And apparently the audiences are great and they love it. And right. it's a nice little throwback. Is there a difference between S Club times. and Steps? What? <laughs> Don't stop moving. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm going to pause you there. We're okay. going to take a break because you two have been chatting far too much, so we have to take a break. Uh, this is Talk TV. These two return after this break. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. 
Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> so, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What? Spaniards. You mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am Sanz. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is. Never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. The one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus. Boris Johnson uh, isn't what he was. Most of them seem to have given up. Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Please. Yeah. Problem solved. He's as up. fit as a butcher's dog. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle <laughs> class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, I know, you're probably going to walk me off the show after saying this girl. I can't say, I'm not, I'm not a Swifty. Critics, I'd say me included, <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. It was a fabulous dinner until <laughs> you two uh, mooned us. <laughs> Thank God for Talk TV. It's not only the home of common sense, it's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back to the final part of Talk Today with me, David Ball. The time 9.47 now on Saturday, October the 21st. The Muldoon is here all morning. Oh. <laughs> I got told off for having no, too much did. bands. You did go well a little bit. By the way... <laughs> <laughs> he just, just had a to get bit. that in there. Just a little bit. Do we think he's Not right? Really. That's the question. Uh, Steve, Steve, is he right or wrong? Steve, Denya, uh, also here. We are partially away, uh, the way through your delights. Uh, by the way, some messages. I don't get the Madonna thing. Now, if you're chatting about Depeche Mode, I'd say now oh, you're talking... Oh, yeah, yeah no, well, I'd love to mode. see Depeche Mode. They were the first, do you know they were the first band to play stadiums? Really were they? They uh, were. There's a great documentary about uh, them I watched years ago because I love Depeche Mode. Yeah, they're amazing. And there was a great mashup um, with one of their songs and one of Madonna's songs. That's right. It yeah. was brilliant. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you see, the difference is Depeche Mode is a 10 out of 10, 100% full pelt music gig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, Madonna yeah. gig is a theatrical show. Yeah. And there is the most incredible. There's <laughs> there's a moment, I'm talking about it again, but she does a song, <laughs> Live to Tell. And she oh, I love that song. around the audience. Right. And oh, it's a slot, you know, this is sad, mm. but people who've passed away from AIDS in the 80s mm. oh, yeah. start appearing, and the, the photographs get smaller and more plentiful. Wow. And just oh, And goodness. there's a thousand faces looking at you, and suddenly, like a prayer. Don't tell me no, any just... more because I want to go and see it. Shall but I go? won't, okay. will I? Um, that reminds me, though, in the original tour, it went from Like a Virgin, do you remember, on exactly the bed, that. into Like a Prayer? Exactly that, yeah. so she's revisited, yeah. and it's so powerful. So are they going to release this on video? Or? I really hope so. Yeah. No, nothing yet, but in it would be... Can, 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 show. Are there any other shows that we can go to with her? Or yes, uh, December the 5th and the 6th. Back she's in back London. at London Zoo 2 oh, for two more shows. Tickets? Well, so let me tell you, two days before, apparently, they're going to be um, releasing production scenes. These are seats, that they're last minute seats, right. and that's what I got a hold of a ticket on Sunday night for. Right. And they're like, a, they are still that was your fourth a couple night. of hundred pounds. That was my second night. Thanks, Ross. <laughs> right, okay. Um, right, okay, enough about you. Okay, sorry, Madonna. Sorry. Uh, let's, now, let's now move on. We've talked about S Club in Manchester. Uh, what to watch on television? Yes. It's very rainy oh, and miserable. God. This is a great one. Tonight from 825, Fleetwood Mac Night on BBC oh. Two. These guys, these guys. 50-year career, mm. um, rumours sold 45 million copies. It's the number six best-selling album 
in history. And wow. there's been 18 members over the years. They've all fallen in love, divorced, hated yeah. each other. Mm. If any, if there should be a biopic about any band, it should be Fleetwood Mac. And popcorn should be provided And of course, well. it transcends <laughs> generations because of Harry Styles. Of course. And the Top Gear um, theme music as well. Yeah. Unbelievable. Exactly that. And so, do, but you it, didn't know I was as as I knowledgeable amazing, isn't she? Since since whatever's in that uh, glass <laughs> has been filled, I think, I think it should be Muldoon's so, life. So, so just was Fleetwood Mac big for you? No, not really. Mm. I'm Fleet, too young. Fleetwood Mac too young. Song. Teen, so, probably. So, well, so when I was at med school, the weirdly, team. that became the band that we all listened to, and I don't yeah. know why, I don't know where the influence came no. from. When was Fleetwood Mac at its height? I would say it's interesting. So, so late 70s rumours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, for me personally, my my first song I heard was Everywhere, and yeah. that came out in yeah. 1988, and that's a beautiful Christine McVie. It's all about her, that mm -hmm. song. It's beautiful. When things were going really well, they're slightly like Eurythmics. When things were going really well, the songs were beautiful. When when we had troubled times, mm. they're a little bit edgier yeah. within the band. But, but, but that's good because it means they're writing with from their heart. Yes, of and course. They're expressing their yeah, emotions. They're, they are incredible, mm. and there's not many bands like them mm. anymore. No, no there aren't. So there you'll aren't. see tonight uh, Fleetwood Mac. All the appearances of the BBC. You'll see them in tour. There's a musical on later on BBC Two. It, it, it's four and a half hours the whole right. evening, and it starts at eight twenty-five tonight. Brilliant. Now you are obviously very popular, and oh. um, someone's coming to visit you. Really? Next, yes. Next week. Now, as far as big names that come in to see Chris Evans and Graham Norton, we've had Hillary Clinton, we had Sarah Ferguson, but next week, possibly like the biggest showbiz name that we could Who? ever. Arnold Schwarzenegger is coming in <laughs> no on Wednesday way. morning. The man is, I mean, he's bodybuilder, movie star, governor, and now Virgin Radio guest. Wow. Um, so he's in on Wednesday morning. Is he actually coming in, he's Steve? Actually in Claire, Claire is going to town. be out there I'm in a not. tent. <laughs> Just making random cups of tea. Just, no, like, Claire. Why are you in on a Wednesday? I mean, I mean, <laughs> people will be looking to see if he's, you know, because he's quite orange. Yeah. They'll be wondered yeah. if he's been got by Just Stop Oil. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, you used to say, have you been tangled? Have yeah. you just been oiled? <laughs> I wonder what he looks like in real life. I know. I'm fascinated. Apparently. Is he tall? Well, I think you would hope so. Imagine if he's like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> apparently, when, when you went for an audition. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. He though. went for his first, uh, like, you yeah. know, casting of a movie, and they uh -huh. said, You'll never be a movie star. You're far too muscly and big. Yeah. People won't yeah. warm to you. Yeah. They won't like you. They won't get well, you. Well, they were and right. The next thing, <laughs> come on, stop it. How funny. Um, so How I think that's name a famous amazing. Arnold Schwarzenegger film apart from The Terminator. The Terminator. What was the movie? The Kindergarten. Kindergarten Pop. Yes. Hop. Yeah, that's so good. Um, <laughs> was there not another one with a baby in it? There was, wasn't no? there? No, I don't know. He's done a few really good films. I mean, honestly, <laughs> it's impossible to get a word in with you two. <laughs> Just carrying on, carry on. Anything else from you? I think that's it. <laughs> not, not unless you want to talk about more Madonna, I'm here. I'm available all day. No, no. We don't. Okay. Steve Denyer, thank you very much. That thank was, you. of course, today's Denyer's Delights. Denyer's <laughs> Delights. <laughs> Apparently you're not leaving, so. Okay. Um, but I'll anyway, stay. you're staying there just for the, for the moment. Um, what's going on in terms of our um, hashtag Breakfast Doctors? Let's on, see. On yeah, we got any? Let's see. Um. <laughs> <laughs> nothing like nothing like being nothing like being Finger prepared. Finger on the pulse. Right. Okay. Let's take a call. Christopher is in Kent. Good morning to you. Good morning, David and Claire. Great to uh, to listen to your program. Uh, it's, I wasn't expecting, actually, I'd, I'd kind of given up, but it's nice to get the call back to have a chat. I, I just feel that uh, society is very disillusioned with politics. I think I've said that to you before. And uh, mm, you the have. business of Rishi Sunak now sort of going over to Netanyahu, I've got no time for. He's about as good at making peace, uh, you know, as, as no one. He's absolutely useless. And I just feel that... Uh, we need a shake-up in politics. I think it would be better if uh, um, if the the Tory leadership was changed. Um, Penny Morden was there to replace him. I think she's she would get a lot more uh, positive feedback from uh, society. Also on reform, I think Alex Phillips. I think Richard Tice is pretty hopeless uh, in my view. And then on the Labour side, uh, Rachel Reeves. So how about that? A complete shake-up um, ruled by women. Wow. Sure yeah, I mean, so, down. so, but, so, so the question I was asking this morning is when should Rishi Sunak call that mm. election? 
w- what would you do if you were him? Would you do well, it? I, would you wait? I, I, sorry, David. I, I think immigration is by far the number one issue. I know we have our home problems here with the NHS and the the police force and so many other aspects of uh, of societies. Uh, but I just feel that the immigration is really the the prime tasks that they have to tackle and they really do have to tackle it i've said before we need to deploy the navy we need to cut the money to france we really need to crack on and people need to be deported otherwise we're going to be ending up with a saddled society of so many different factions from here there and everywhere that we won't have a chance to sort of get back to some form of normality I don't think Rishi Sunak is the one to do it. I think he's just making efforts to to muster support. But I don't think his heart is really in it. Keir Starmer, absolutely no chance. He'll flip-flop. I I think he'll take us back into Europe. I don't think he'll address the immigration issue. Talking about tackling the traffickers, uh, he's got a hope in hell. I mean, they're mafiosa. They're mafia types. He's not going to be able to challenge them. Well... Uh, um, I mean, they're, they're, they're all interesting thoughts, as I said very much. Uh, thank you, Christopher, very much for that. I mean, in terms of the by-elections, when you look at the numbers, this was more about people staying at home or Conservative voters staying at, at home and not actually uh, voting for other parties. When you look at actually Labour's vote, as I said, Labour didn't really change in terms of polling numbers, but, of course, those swings were absolutely enormous. One man who knows a great deal about politics, Nick Dubois, joins us this morning. Good morning. Well, I so good morning, I said. I certainly know about losing elections. <laughs> no. I've lost more than I've won. Uh, you do so, in style, though, Nick. So, so last night on the talk, uh, yeah. someone they were all talking prophetically about 1997, and yes. eventually I said, well, as the only person who fought an election in 97, I can mm. point out some similarities. Yeah. So so is the, do you, do, what do you feel? Do you feel that this is actually about the Conservative voters staying at home, not exercising the vote? I, I don't think Starmer has this in the no, vote. No, I think if you, you look at the swing, it was 24%. Starmer's vote actually grew by 12%, so there's obviously a disconnect there already. Yeah. So your, your, your central analysis is, is absolutely right, David, except the, the differences and the mistake quite a few Conservatives are making MPs is they think, if you like, the lazy assumption those voters are coming back. They're not. The difference here with 97 is, is quite obviously there's no Tony Blair, and there was huge mo- momentum. Conservatives were at ease with the idea of voting for Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, mm. rightly or wrongly. Now, whilst they're not terrified of Starmer, Actually, what's keeping them at home at the moment is the fact that they've lost absolutely any recognition mm. with their Conservative Party. Now, the downside of that is uh, uh, it's going to make it very hard to call the next election. The reason why quite a lot of those, my wife included, I 